The Prophecy Club, a nationwide television program, a nationwide radio program. The Prophecy Club also hosts approximately 40 major city meetings per month. Our mission is to inform Christians of current events that confirm Bible prophecy, expose the evil devices of Satan, warn believers what is coming to America, challenge people to stop sinning and turn to Jesus with all their heart and to provide a platform for Christian speakers to be heard. It's a bald-faced lie using the positions of power and authority in our own government. The greatest oil field in the world is at the southwest end of the Dead Sea. He said, Son, you must warn this nation. And now your host for the Prophecy Club, Stan Johnson. Welcome to the Prophecy Club, where we provide information and resources with a prophetic warning message to win souls to Jesus and to call people to repentance. All right, your topic tonight is the sons of God and the Antichrist. Now, why is that important? I personally believe that these, whatever you want to call them, sons of God, these aliens, the UFO, all of that stuff is all part of a big Trap. The Bible calls it a strong delusion. As a matter of fact, we've got another video DVD we're going to be making tomorrow night on the strong delusion. And I realize that we take a risk as, at a, as a ministry even mentioning this uh, because there's a lot of people who can say, oh boy, what a bunch of wackos. Well, I'll tell you what, I'd rather be telling you the truth and be found to be telling you the truth than to stay politically correct. And so we do take a risk in bringing this information to you because invariably there will be some people that will stop their support of this ministry. But since they didn't start the ministry, and since they're not the ones that's really supporting it, and since our heart is really to please the Lord, then um, I'm, we ought to obey God rather than men, right? Thank you. Thank you. It's a good enthusiastic group in here. That's right. Um, I believe that this whole UFO thing could very well send a lot of people to hell. And as a watchman, I feel it my duty to expose it. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you this. My agent said to me, he said, Now, Stan, he said, as your agent, it's my job to see that your ministry has the very best reputation it can possibly have. And I said, Yes, I understand that. He said, So, of course, you can do what you want to do. But as your agent, I've got to send up a red flag on this UFO stuff. And that's his job. He was right in doing it. And I said, well, I understand that. I said, but I believe that I'm supposed to get this out. And uh, matter of fact, I'll even tell you one more quick little story as part of the introduction. Back in about 96, somewhere in there, Prophecy Club was going on a television station in a nearby city. I won't mention the city. We'd been on the right on the TV there for about six months, and we put on Norio Hayakawa making the videotape Lying Signs and Wonders, talking about UFOs and how he felt like it was going to be a big deception as well. And when they saw us inviting that speaker in, going to put him on TV, they canceled the program. I remember when I hung the phone up from that, Leslie took about three steps. I told her, well, they just canceled us from TV because they don't want to have that UFO stuff on. She took three steps, turned around, and she says, I just heard the Lord say that because of that, within 30 days, he'll lose his job. Within three months, they'll sell the station. Within 30 days, the general manager of that TV station was fired. Within three months, the station was sold. So I believe God wants this message out. I believe he does. And I believe there's going to be a time when there's going to be pastors, and I encourage you pastors, I'm also a pastor, to call and get some of this information because it is very important that we know the tricks and the traps of the devil. I believe one of the pictures he's going to paint, and this is, I feel necessary to say this, we just had Tom Deckard, prophet of God, never missed, 
one of the things that he was shown in his vision that the UFO guys will come down and make open contact with the peoples of the earth. Kind of like the Independence Day. A lot of that stuff is really fiction based on fact in the movies, okay? I believe that these UFOs may, these sons of God, really of Genesis 6, what they may do is come down and all of a sudden we see all of this suppressed technology. There are free energy devices. I saw one work when I was a kid. I know that there could be free energy. I know it. I've also heard from reliable sources that they do have carburetors that will go over 100 miles to a gallon. But it's been suppressed. Many kinds of, of cures, cancer cures and things like this. So the UFO guys come down and all of a sudden this technology that has been suppressed, that had it not been suppressed, we would have come up with it ourselves anyway. All of a sudden that comes out and they start creating a new world, a new world order, you see. And then they're going to point to this other guy over here and they're going to say, this guy here, he's the real truth. Now, by the way, we've got to set you straight on a couple other things that you peoples of the earth have been misled on. For example, the Bible is not real. That's what they're going to say, brothers and sisters. And Jesus Christ, well, he was just a man. And other foolishness like this. And the Bible says that God is going to send a strong delusion so that all those that have not already come to the knowledge of the truth that Jesus is Lord would believe a lie and be damned. You take the people that have not already received Jesus as Lord, what chance do they have of surviving a deception like that? Slim to none. But the good news is, God is going to help us with a little... We'll be hoping with a little help, Daniel says. And I believe there's going to be a lot of... Matter of fact, I believe there'll be more people saved from now to the millennium than from now back to Adam. They say that there's more people alive right now than have lived through all eternity. The greatest soul winning time is probably going to happen in our lifetime. Now, with that, let me introduce our speaker. The title is The Sons of God and the Antichrist. Bill Snevlin has seen over 100 UFOs and studied them for over 40 years. He's a member of the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomenon, NICAP. Interviewed, over 100 people have been abducted including Christians, by the way. Bill will show pictures of physical evidence of the sons of God. He will explain their connections to black magic, fallen angels, DNA, and how it relates to the mark of the beast, and a counterfeit gospel. Bill says the sons of God will reveal themselves and be a part of deceiving millions of people, including Christians, into denying Jesus. Will you help me welcome Bill Sniblin. God bless and welcome. No, thank you. It's <clears throat> great to be here. Just one slight correction. I was a member of NICAP. Amen. I am no more involved in that. That was when I was a young, you know, young person. But anyhow, I'm not even sure the organization is still out there. Um, as we've already been told, the title of the talk is The Sons of God, in Hebrew, the B'nai Elohim, and the Antichrist. And... We want to start out by just a little bit of a scripture verse. The place that we're, we're dealing with tonight is, of course, a lot from Genesis chapter 6. And the core verse there is verse 2, where it says, The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. So the question becomes, what are these sons of God, these B'nai Elohim? What does this passage mean? Because it's very controversial. We're going to get into that in a moment. But first of all, I just want to talk a little about my own, my own um, background and everything with this. Uh, as Stan said, I've been an avid student of this stuff for over 40 years. And uh, I've watched it grow from a very much of a fringy kind of thing where only a handful of isolated kooks like me were involved in it, to where it's become is still somewhat marginalized. That's why I think there's resistance to receiving it in the church as a subject. But now there are many millions of people that are really involved in this. And it's, it's grown considerably. And over the years as I've talked about this, because I have about four or five tapes 
dealing with the UFO phenomenon, videos or audios, whatever. And oftentimes, people will ask me, well, were you abducted? Was I abducted by aliens? Because people look at my background and they say, what, you know, how could anybody do all this weird stuff unless something bizarre, something totally stunningly bizarre like being, you know, abducted by aliens and taken to a spaceship and having, you know, little pointy things stuck up your nose and stuff like that, you know, how, how else could you explain me being this weird kind of person, especially because I had a otherwise very normal, nice upbringing, you know, with good parents and all of that. Well, before I answer that question, I want to explain the close encounter grid. Um, back, I think it was in the 70s, the guy who used to run Project Blue Book, that was the Air Force's um, supposed investigative committee to look at UFO reports that came into them. Because their job, their mandate from the government, the Air Force, is to protect our skies. That's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to keep bad guys out of our skies. And so anyhow, this professor, J. Allen Hynek, he came up with a kind of a formula to sort of categorize where these very, because they were getting thousands of UFO reports a year. And so he categorized them as close encounters of four kinds. Close encounter, or the first kind, is like a distant sighting. Like if I'm sitting there in my car, you know, waiting at an intersection, and I look up and I see, a, you know, this unexplained object. Now remember, that's all a UFO is. It's an unexplained object an unidentified object that happens to be flying. It does not have to be from the planet Venus. You know, it does not have to be a spaceship. It might be. It could be any number of things. Until I know what it is, it is a UFO. Maybe later on I find out, oh, that was a weather balloon that was going over. Or maybe it was marsh gas. You never know. So anyway, so that's the close encounter of the first kind. Close encounter of the second kind is when a UFO is sighted in the air and then subsequently somebody finds evidence on the ground. By that we mean things like, you know, impressions in grass, burn marks, uh, skid marks, uh, or even maybe radiation or anomalous levels of um, bioelectric energy, things like that, or even something like a crop circle. Okay. Close encounter of the third kind, of course, that's the thing that they made the movie about and everything, but that's when you have an actual encounter with a UFO op occupant. Maybe, you know, you're standing there and this UFO comes down out of the sky and this guy comes out and says, Klatu Barada Nikto, and gets back in his ship and up he goes again. Uh, so that's a close encounter of the third kind. Then after a few years, they decided they needed a fourth one, and that's close encounter of a fourth kind, which is a very close encounter because you're usually kidnapped, taken aboard a spacecraft, supposedly, and have medical experiments done to you. And you don't get much closer than that, you know. So I want to just, you know, emphasize that. It also depends on the context. You know, something that might be considered a UFO in one generation might be considered something entirely different in another. Let me illustrate. If you know the origins of Mormonism and what you see up there is a stained glass representation of supposedly how the Mormon church got started. Joseph Smith was, you know, a young man in the days of what they called the Great Revival, where all of these preachers were going over the colonies and, and the early states of the Union preaching and people were getting saved. There were revival meetings all over the place, so much so it was called the Burned Over District. Because it was like the revival fibers had gone through so many times, it was like hardly anybody was left that hadn't been touched by them. And, you know, he was being propositioned by Methodists and propositioned by Presbyterians. And he wanted to know what church to join. And he never read the Bible. He came from this shiftless, good-for-nothing family where basically his parents were con artists and occultists. And he claims, according to the story, he never read the Bible in his life. And he was maybe 16 years old. And they had this enormous family Bible. And he opened it up and happened to fall open to James 1, where, of course, it says, If any man needeth wisdom, let him ask of God, give it to all men liberally, and upbraideth not. And so he took that, and he went out into the woods to pray. 
to what has come to be known as the Sacred Grove near Palmyra, New York. I don't know if any of you have been there or not, but it's supposed to be a very pretty little spot. Anyhow, he knelt down and prayed. And this is, this is the part that's important. As he's praying, he says, all of a sudden, a beam of light came down from heaven. And it just was like this cylinder of light that encircled him. And he didn't know what was going on. And he continued to pray and ask, what church should I join? And then all of a sudden, he said he was enveloped with this darkness that was suffocating, that he felt he, could, he couldn't even live in it. It was like taking the air out of his very lungs. And he cried out for help. And at that moment, the darkness dissipated. And he saw this pillar of light again, except in the middle of it were two glorious personages dressed entirely in white that glowed in the dark. And they looked exactly alike. And one gestured to the other and said, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Now, I'm not going to tell you the rest of the story. If you want to find out about that, get my Mormon tape. They have a thing called What's Wrong with Mormonism here, a video. But the point is, that's how a whole now 10 million member religion started. But if you look at that, and you look at it through the eyes of our modern, scientific, technologically oriented worldview, you would just easily say, oh, there was a UFO up there and they beam somebody down or two somebody's down, just like, you know, the Star Trek Enterprise doohickey. And zip, there they are and they're dressed in white and they glow, you know, just like space brothers do. And, you know, there was even this kind of mysterious darkness and everything. It could just as easily be a UFO encounter as an encounter with a divine being. I personally don't think it was either one. Then we have the Fatima apparition. This is the thing that happened in 1917 where supposedly these three children in Portugal had seen this lady. And believe it or not, she came down out of the sky in a bubble of light, just like, you know, Glinda the Good Witch and the Wizard of Oz. And she was dressed entirely in white, except she had a blue sash on and she glowed. And this glowing thing is getting real popular. And so anyway... They had all these different encounters with her, and this was getting very famous because this was a very devout part of where people were really into the Catholic Church. And at one point, all these people had gathered to see the lady, quote-unquote. That's what she called herself, the lady. And it was raining cats and dogs, and they all had umbrellas. It was miserable. You know, they were all like, I forget how many thousand people standing there in the rain. And these three little kids were praying. None of them were more than 12 years old. And all of a sudden, the sky parts miraculously. And you see the sun. But then all of a sudden, the sun starts moving. And it starts going like this and going like this and dipping and barreling, rolling and doing all these strange things. And, of course, the people were totally freaked. Because, then again, thousands of people saw this. But nobody else saw it. I mean, the people up in Paris didn't see it. The people in London didn't see it. So obviously it wasn't the sun. Now again, looking at that from our perspective as a space age, technologically oriented society, we would say, oh, that was a UFO. And maybe that lady that came down was a Nordic goddess from the planet Tralfamador. And she was here to help us get past our next stage of human evolution. So I said all of that because some of the things I'm about to tell you about my particular experiences, you know, they could be taken either way. So I keep an open mind. We need to exe objectively examine Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. That should be Genesis 6. I'm sorry, that's a typo. 6, 1 to 5. These are obviously B'nai Elohim. There's no question about that. Let's read the passage. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with men, for that he is also flesh. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that. Notice, that's important. And also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bare children unto them, and the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown, and God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Okay. 
Now, it's very clear that they married the daughters of men, quote unquote. And they fathered children which were either giants, and the Hebrew word there is Nephilim, or mighty men, men of renown. Now, because of that, we had some awful things happen. The earth became so horribly wicked. This has never been happened in the history of the world before or since. Things were so bad that he had to destroy virtually all life on the planet. And we all know the story, except for Noah and his family, and, of course, the animals that he took on the ark. Everything else was wiped out in this catastrophic flood. So whatever was happening there must have been really awful. I mean, a lot worse even maybe than what's happening, you know, in this century. There's two theories about the sin. One is that the B'nai Elohim were the godly line of Seth, quote unquote. This is a standard theological line you'll get in most seminaries. Uh, and the daughters of men were simply children of wicked Cainites. In other words, descendants of Cain. There's some problems with this. The first problem is that there's scant scriptural support. What I mean by that is nowhere in the Old Testament is the phrase B'nai Elohim, sons of God, used of human beings. For example, I, you know, I don't have time to read them, but if you go to Job 1.6, I'll read this one. Now, there came a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Now, obviously, this is up in the heavenly court, so these are not men. Also, Job 2.1. Job 38, 5 and 7. All of those passages are clearly referring to celestial beings. Now, there are some passages in the New Testament. For example, Romans 8, 14. It says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And there are other passages. But notice, all of this is after Calvary. All of this is after the cross. Before that, nobody could be adopted as it were, into the family of Yahweh. After the cross, that could happen. We could literally become sons of God. But there were no sons of God in the Old Testament except angels. Since the new birth prophesied in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, but not present, we can indeed become sons and daughters of Elohim. Thus, from the standpoint of scriptures, it is unlikely that these B'nai Elohim were simply godly men. The other thing about this is History provides many examples of godly men marrying nasty women, but they didn't have giant kids, did they? I mean, I'm sure probably a lot of you know people that are, you know, good men, but they made a mistake and married some, you know, trollop of a woman or something or some unbeliever or whatever, and they had perfectly normal kids. You know, they didn't have like giants or people like, you know, Superman or something. So, you know, even historically that doesn't hold water. Then thirdly, there's little evidence for a godly line of Seth, quote-unquote, in the Bible. This makes it sound like, like the descendants of Seth where you should forgive the expression perfect little angels. And actually, they weren't. In fact, if you look at it, the, the immediate son of Seth was kind of a doofus, you know. And beyond that, none of these people, if, if the godly line of Seth was so godly, why do we have the flood? You know, why did Yahweh have to wipe out probably everything on earth? So this, this whole thing, it may be politically correct, but it doesn't hold water. The second theory is that daughters of men were just that, human women, and the B'nai Elohim were actually celestial beings, fallen angels. This is the common use in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, and it also makes sense in the light of the extraordinary offspring that they were having. Now, the other thing we want to look at is Paul's mysterious warning in 1 Corinthians 11. There he says that women should cover their heads, quote-unquote, because of the angels. Now, what does that mean? And I would submit to you that what it means is this. Is that just as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of David, as it is back in the days of Paul and it is today, Angels can be tempted by the beauty of human women. Even as much as they are in the presence of Yahweh and all of the benefits that that would have, they can be tempted into falling into sin. And that to have a covering protects the women 
from the predation of these angels, these fallen celestial beings. And just as a sidebar, we have found a very interesting thing in our ministry is that with, with women who are having problems, like with a succubus-type spirit, an incubus-type spirit, these are sexual demons that come and prey on people when they're trying to sleep or when they're actually asleep, uh, or other kinds of manifestation of a similar nature, even people who are being victimized by what seems to be alien abduction. And these are believers now. These are Christian women. Is What we did is we thought, well, gee, maybe we should just, duh, follow the Bible's advice. We told them to wear a head covering to sleep. And you know what? It completely vanished. The problem completely went away. You know, if at first you don't succeed, read the directions. Amen? <laughs> So anyhow, this to me is an indication that here, even in the New Covenant, in, in the New Testament with the Corinthian church, Paul is, is giving his flock that is committed to his charge a warning that they need to be very careful to cover their heads for the sake of the angels. Because you women don't realize how appealing you are to angels. You have no idea. Then we have Yahweh's law of reproduction. We know that everything reproduces after his kind. If you have a daddy horse and a mommy horse, they get a baby horse. You can tell I don't have a lot of experience with farms. I don't know what they, a mare and a whatever, anyhow, a, a little baby horse, a cold, a foal, whatever they call it. Uh, <clears throat> so, with that in mind, what sort of offspring might come from an angel-human match? Think about it. Because it would have the qualities of humanity, but it would also have the qualities of the angelic nature. Nephilim. Nephilim. The other interesting thing is there's a lot of controversy about the word Nephilim. It does come from the Hebrew word, which a root of a Hebrew word, which means to fall. And so some people take this that they, they are fallen ones. They're angels that you know fell out of heaven or else their offspring fell out of heaven or something like that. But <clears throat> many translators, including, of course, the King James, render it as giants. And that makes sense, too, because we do know there were and are giants running around. The other interesting thing is that we know about the Nephilim is that Isaiah 26:14 says that the deceased shall not rise in the resurrection. Now we know that's not true because we know that both the righteous dead and the unrighteous dead will rise in their respective resurrections. But what I want to point out to you there is that in the Hebrew, the word there for deceased in that verse is Rephaim. Now Rephaim is one of as sub-races of Nephilim. So, for example, there's the Anakim and the Rephaim, and I think there's the Zamzumim, and don't you love these names? And then, of course, finally, the Nephilim. I, I was tickled when, when you know, the, 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 these latest Star Wars movies have come out, and notice the name of, of the Skywalker that turns into Darth Vader. His name is Anakin. One letter difference between Anakim, the race of giants, that were the scourge of Israel. So what this is telling us, if we can properly parse the passage, is that the giants, the Nephilim, will not rise in the resurrection, which would make sense. The question becomes, how come Noah was immune? Well, the interesting thing is here is that the the Bible says in that context that <clears throat> he was perfect in his generation. Now, the word generation there is taken to mean his offspring, his DNA, you know, his ability to reproduce himself. And the word perfect there in Hebrew is tamim, which means without blemish. It's the same word that is used of the sacrifices in the temple. When they say, you know, like in... In Leviticus, you must offer a lamb without blemish. That's the word that's used. So what that means is, is that his human generative ability were not contaminated by the B'nai Elohim. He had kept himself pure. And evidently he had married a wife who was similarly 
free of this sort of contamination. And obviously, they were one of the very few left on the earth of whom that could be said. So, by genetic control and manipulation of these hybrids, Satan was out to rob Yahweh of the people that he had made for himself. In other words, he knew the Messiah was coming down the pike. He heard what was said to the serpent in the Garden of Eden, and he was trying to corrupt the human line so that no Messiah could come forth from it. Now, a lot of times in this discussion, people come up with Matthew 22:30, And here Yeshua talks about, he's talking about really the context of the resurrection. But he says that, you know, angels cannot marry, nor are angels in heaven cannot marry, nor be given in marriage. And a lot of people say, well, see, that means angels can't have sex. Well, I mean, how many people realize you can have sex without being married? You know, not that it's right, but you can do it. I mean, it's happening obviously every day. Does it also follow that they are sexless? Obviously, there are people here on earth who never marry, they're called to a single state, or else they are, maybe they just can't get a girl or something. <laughs> anyway, or you think of monks or nuns, both Catholic or Buddhist, that live a life of celibacy. Does that mean they're sexless? You know, talk to some. No. They have the same drives, the same needs that we have. They just try to, you know, suppress it and offer it up and sort of poor souls in purgatory or whatever. And they try to get by. Now, the other thing is, is that from all indications, the angels in the scriptures are male. I'm sorry, ladies. There are no cute little gauzy winged angels and long flowing and blonde hair like you see in the gift stores, you know. Uh, in fact, they're all pretty scary looking, really. I mean, most of the time when people see an angel in the Bible, they probably fall on their face in dread. And, and it's interesting, I've, I've seen angels, I've been blessed by the Almighty to see them one or two times. And at one time, I was just totally out of the blue, we were really under a kind of a siege. This is when I was working with uh, Ed Decker at Saints Alive, and we were praying at his house on the second floor. And we were really having a really serious prayer meeting and crying out and asking for angelic protection. I forget what the actual issue was we were praying about. Well, all of a sudden, he looked out the window, Ed, and... and there was an angel walking around outside and it was as tall as the second story of the house. And he nudged me and I looked and I saw it too. And it was, it was this like, you know, 15, 20 foot tall blonde guy with long flowing hair and a white robe carrying this enormous flaming sword. And it was like he was marching around the house. And we just, you know, I had chills and everything because it was just... The kind of thing where you could see if that was, I mean, he was totally not even paying attention to us. But, I mean, if something like that actually showed up at your doorstep, you know, you'd really, you know, fall on your knees, at the very least. Um, <clears throat> and, of course, as I said, the final question about that is, just because someone does not marry does not prevent them from having intercourse. The deal is, is that these angels are singing, sinning. They're not in heaven. They're down here on the earth where they shouldn't be, and that's usually when we get into sin, right? Is when we go somewhere we're not supposed to be. And, um, and Satan is whispering in their ear and saying, hey, you want, you want to check out that cute little number over there on the street corner or whatever, you know? So, uh, and that's how that happens. So I don't think that you can use Matthew 22:30 as any kind of a proof text that angels aren't allowed to marry. To, well, they aren't allowed to marry, but if they fall, they do it anyway. But I do believe it's not natural to them. Because obviously, if angels are immortal, they don't need to reproduce. The only reason we need to reproduce ourselves is because we tend to, you know, die after 70 years or so. So, you know, we need to do it, but they don't. Now, the Genesis account of the pre-flood sin is substantially fleshed out by apocryphal books. Now, what I mean by apocryphal books? Well, these are books that are not canon. They're not part of the canon of Scripture, but yet they're regarded as having some degree of validity in an historical or a doctrinal context. Uh, among these are the Genesis Apocryphon and the Book of Enoch. The word um, actually refers to the fact that they are secondary books. 
They're not to be taken as inspired. But now this is interesting. Jude. If you go to the book of Jude, this little tiny book that everybody can't find because it's sort of buried in the shadow of Revelations. And it's usually only a page long in most Bibles. But in that epistle, which was written by the brother, half-brother of the Lord, he talks, he quotes Enoch. In verse 14, And Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints, to execute justice, judgment, I'm sorry, upon all, and convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. Now think of that. Here is an inspired writer quoting from this book. And obviously, if Yahweh didn't want it in there, he would have not allowed that. So he must have a fairly good impression of the book of Enoch even if it isn't Scripture. It, it has some value. And Jude, like most Jews of the day, was well aware of it and did not hesitate to quote from it. And interestingly enough, the book of Enoch contains the first literary reference to a pre-existent Messiah. In other words, the idea that the Messiah would be up in heaven first as a divine being before him coming here to earth. So that's very doctrinally sound. It contains an account of Enoch's visit to a fifth heaven where he saw giants with faces withered and the silence of their mouths perpetual. He calls them the Grogori, or fallen angels who broke their vows, married the daughters of men, and befouled the earth with their deeds. The son, and this is taken, by the way, I should tell you, from um, Enoch chapter 1, verse 9, chapter 5, verse 4, and chapter 27, verse 2. That's what, those passages are what are quoted in the epistle of Jude. Um, the sons of God in the book of Enoch are also called watchers. Now, if you're a stu student of the Bible, you'll know that that same word is also used where? In Daniel. Daniel a couple times saw a watcher. It says, Behold a watcher and an holy one. That's how it's rendered in the authorized version. Uh, the watchers can also be translated as shining ones. There's another word for them. The book of Enoch states that 200 of these watchers descended to earth in the days of Jared, i.e. Genesis 5.18. Some of them were given names, and the worst of all of them was Azazel. Okay. Now, what's interesting for those of you that are, that are TV trivia buffs, the bad guy in the Smurfs show is called Azazel. Remember the Smurfs years ago? I don't think they were still on the air. But anyhow, they had this... Bad, and he was called Azazel. So somebody's reading their apocryphal literature on television. Azazel is accused, listen to this, of scattering over the earth the secrets of heaven and hath rebelled against the Mighty One. He was giving away classified documents. What was he teaching them? Well, will you hear this? These watchers against Yahweh's wishes not only married human women, but they taught human beings astrology. Not only that, they taught us how to fashion weapons. Before this, there were no weapons. Now, you're ready for this. This is a scary one. They taught women how to use cosmetics. <sighs> they were teaching occult secrets to their children in the Philem. They taught the black arts to all the people that would listen. It says that the watchers, there arose so much godlessness, and they committed fornication, and they were led astray and became corrupt in all of their ways. End of quote. Now, none of this contradicts the Torah. It just fleshes it out a little. As a tertiary note of interest, much of this same material is also found in pagan sources like Greco-Roman mythology, the Teutonic mythology, Hindu mythology like the Mahabharata, and also the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is an ancient Babylonian uh, literary work. I only mention that because, and this is important to understand, because you'll get, if you witness to enough either witches or new agers, you're going to get something like this thrown at you, and I want to tell you what to say. You'll often hear people say, well, there's all kinds of this stuff going on out there. Jesus isn't the only one who rose from the dead. There's all these other people that rose from the dead. I mean, Addis rose from the dead. Adonis rose from the dead. There, uh, Osiris rose from the dead. Blah, 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 you know. 
and it, there's so many of the images of the virgin, the virgin mother, the virgin birth, you know, Isis and all of this stuff. You've, I'm sure you've heard some of this. Uh, and they say, so he's just one of many. But you see, what they don't realize is one important thing. What happened after the flood? Don't you think Noah was re-given the Messianic promise that was given to Adam if he didn't know it already? And he taught. That's called the Proto-Evangelion in Greek, the original giving of the gospel, the good news, that, that, Eve, that Eve's seed would crush the head of the serpent. Anyway, think about this. He taught this to his three sons. They taught it to their sons. And off it went, especially with the Tower of Babel being spread all over the world. But just like anything else, without written revelation, it got a little distorted. It got to India, and it became the legend of the Mahabharata. It got to Egypt, and it became Isis and Osiris and Horus, and so on and so on and so on. That doesn't invalidate the true fact that Yeshua died on the cross and rose from the dead and was born of a virgin. All it does is it shows that the initial impact of that promise, originally in the Garden of Eden, carried through Noah into all the race of the world, was so powerful that it rippled with these cultural traces through every nation in the world. Because if we believe the Scriptures to be true, which I do, then everybody on earth is descended from either Shem, Ham, or Japheth. Amen? That's it. You know, except for fruit flies. But anyway, now, years ago, some, I forget who it was, I think it was Zachariah Sitchin, claimed that fruit flies came from Venus. That a comet came and landed on the earth and flies fell off the comet. That's why they're so weird. And that's, that's partly why they're associated with the devil. Because the devil is associated with the planet Venus. Because Venus is the rising star, the morning star, the evening star. Uh, so that's how come the devil became known as Baal Zebuf, the Lord of the Flies. Anyway, what did that have to do with anything? Uh, <laughs> so the point I guess I was making, if I could remember it, <laughs> is that this, this echo of the truth doesn't invalidate the truth. It just means that down through the years, all these different cultures... We're dealing with the truth in their own way. Just like, for example, think of this. Every culture on earth has the idea of sacrifice. The idea if I do something wrong, I have to do something to appease the gods. Whether it's kill an animal, whether it's maybe just gash my wrist and let some blood pour out upon the ground, or maybe even, Yahweh forbid, human sacrifice. The idea that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin, it's like hardwired into human consciousness on every continent whether you're Aboriginal in Australia, whether you're Africa, whether you're European, whether you're Native Americans. They all do it. And why do you think the, the Sundance people here in the New World, they put those talons of eagles in the chests of the men and string them up into the face of the, of the noonday sun? I mean, that's a metaphor for the crucifixion. You know? The power of truth is such that it will percolate through anything. You can't keep truth out. It will swirl and it will find an entry. Anyway, so this is the whole idea. And I think we need to take this material from these secondary sources like the Book of Enoch seriously because they do help us understand some things. Now, let's have a closer look at angels because angels are real big right now, uh, as they say in the media trade. Uh, the word angel comes from the word angelos in Greek or melech. In Hebrew, both can be translated as a messenger. Uh, they're often terrifying and beautiful beings, unlike popular media today. They are almost always terrifying, such as in Judges 6.22 and Judges 13.20, although they can also appear to be normal men. Remember, uh, the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 13.2 that we may entertain angels unaware. They refuse to be worshipped or direct people to worship anything but the true and living Elohim, like Revelation 19.10 and Revelation 22.9. And I'm sorry, folks, they don't have wings or halos. That's a popular misconception. There are beings like the cherubim and the seraphim that do have wings. 
but you never see an angel in the Bible with wings. They are not chubby, naked babies, nor are they appear to be female. So forget about the little chubby Cupid guys, you know, that are flying around going boing like this with bows and arrows, even though we call those cherubs. If you were to see a real cherub, you would probably fall on your back in astonishment. Because they, they, there's carvings from many ancient cultures. Because, of course, the Hebrews were forbidden to carve images. With the one exception, of course, of the Ark of the Covenant. And so we don't have anything from their, their point of view. But uh, the cherub is a winged bull of awesome appearance. That's what their natural state is. Um, in the New Testament... They invariably testify of Yeshua the Messiah. So if your angels that you're dealing with don't have these five or six characteristics I just mentioned, watch out. They might not be the real McCoy. The angels we get in popular culture today are very different. Uh, for example, there are more often than not gauzy romantic females. They almost never testify of Yeshua or his gospel except maybe during the Christmas season. You know, and we have... Be kind to God week, I call it. The one week of the year where they cram in all of these, you know, pseudo-Christmas, Christmassy, pseudo-Christian TV shows. And of course, we have the annual appearance of the Ten Commandments during Lent. You know, that's the other be kind to God week. Otherwise, television doesn't hate to trash him every chance they get. Um, these angels on TV and in the movies only talk of love and mercy, never judgment. And there are spiritual creatures who are training people to get in contact with their angels. Did you know if you go into like a big bookstore, you can find angel tarot decks. You can find angel channeling books, how to channel your own angel and get guidance from your angels. And there are even supposed angels now singing on CDs. Now, wouldn't that be a bestseller, having angels singing on a CD? So... And it gets, it gets better and better, folks. You go to Hollywood. Since 1947, which is the year of the flying saucer in Roswell, Hollywood has been promoting a romantic fantasy idea of angels coming down and falling in love with human women. For example, 1947. Some of you may remember this. Maybe not you're old enough to have seen it, but to have seen it on TV. The Bishop's Wife, Cary Grant and Loretta Young, where Cary Grant plays a dapper angel. And guess what happens? He falls in love with a human woman. Imagine that. Then in 1987, 40 years later, we have Wings of Desire, which is a European movie, which has an angel fall for a human woman. Then just so nobody feels left out, we have the movie, same year, 87, Date with an Angel, in which a gorgeous blonde female angel gives up her angelic nature to fall in love with a human male. Then we have the thing you see up there, The Preacher's Wife, which is basically a remake of The Bishop's Wife. And in this case, we have the handsome Denzel Washington, who everybody is like, yeah, he's pretty good looking. Probably better looking than Cary Grant, in fact. And he nearly breaks up a preacher's marriage because he's, you know, having thoughts about his, the preacher's wife and actually courts her because the preacher is too busy being a preacher. Then we have Prophecy 2 in 1998. Here, a good angel assumes human form and to sire a child by a mortal woman to save humanity from the fallen archangel Gabriel's evil plans. Excuse me, chapter and verse on that one. Uh, and then uh, most recently, as far as I know, The City of Angels in 1998, which is a remake of Wings of Desire. Notice how Hollywood has so few new ideas with high-octane stars like Meg Ryan and Nicolas Cage. And all of these are, what are they doing? They're promoting the idea of, oh, you know, human women are so sexy and so beautiful that if an angel comes down here, he's just going to trip all over his wings and harp and fall head over heels for this woman. You know, is this just Hollywood being romantic or is there a more sinister agenda here? Well, Yeshua warned us in Luke 17 as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Well, we're definitely in the last times. Amen? I mean, Hebrews 1-2 says we were in the last times back when Hebrews was written. 
So the only sin, as I mentioned, specifically mentioned in Genesis 6, is this intermingling of fallen angels with human women. Thus it's only natural that beginning right after the Roswell incident, Hollywood would start acclimating us to the romantic possibilities for ladies to have affairs with angels. Of course, angels would always treat you better. In all of these movies, the angels are much better at courting women. Of course, they're sexier. And they just do things that no human male can do, you know. So what woman wouldn't fall in love with an angel? Especially with like Denzel Washington, you know. Anyway, um, from the Bible, a few further points need to be explained. Angels, and I already touched on this, in their natural condition cannot procreate with humans. That relates to Matthew 22:30. Angels have glorified human bodies of flesh and bone. They're very much like what we will be in the resurrection. Okay? Um, so therefore, that's why an angel cannot possess a person. Only a demon can possess a person. Because you can't get two bodies in here. There's only room for one physical body within this shape. Okay. Now, an interesting thing here. Adam and Eve may not have originally had blood in their veins. You ever think about that? Notice what Adam says to Eve. He says, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Nothing about blood. And some Bible commentators believe, and as do I, that the fruit that Adam ate and Eve ate was a grape. And then when they ate that forbidden fruit, it transformed them somehow. It changed their DNA and they got whatever used to be in their bodies. And some people believe it was actually light. The light of Yahweh that flowed through every vein in their body. And that's why they lived forever. And that's what we're going to be in the resurrection. Because remember what it says. It says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. So when we're in heaven, even as a resurrected being in the end of time, we're not going to have blood in our veins. We're going to have something altogether more wonderful. So anyway... Something happened to them and blood flowed into their veins and with it came mortality. Okay. Now it's interesting, this use of the grape, because you know the grape has this kind of interesting ambivalence in Scripture. On the one hand, it's used in the Passover. You know, Yeshua used it in the Last Supper, the fruit of the vine. But yet on the other hand, if you want to be a really righteous, on-fire Israelite and take a Nazarene vow, you're not allowed to touch anything of the grape. Not even raisins, not grapes, not wine, not grape juice, not anything. I'd also point out the fact that there's some miracles that happen that kind of direct our attention in this way. Just as a, for instance, the, um, the turning of the Red Sea into blood. The turning of water into wine at the wedding at Cana by Yeshua. You know, those, those are two examples where there's this strange relationship between a clear, pure liquid versus blood slash wine. Now, in order... Let's see. Let me go back. In order for these angels to be able to reproduce, what they have to do is drink human blood. And that's where it gets pretty gross because, of course, this is something Yahweh forbids throughout the entire Bible. In doing so, they would have lost much of their angelic power but probably not their angelic intellect, which is truly formidable. This is additionally the origin of the vampire cult from Eastern Europe, which has been with us since the dawn of time. And this is interesting, too, because uh, ancient legends tell us that supposedly the place where these B'nai Elohim first came down was in Sidon, which is a, a region in the Holy Land area. And then they went north into what today would be the Balkans, Hungary, Romania, places like that. And that's where they actually settled. And these are, this is today where, this is the place where the vampire legends come, the idea of, of these supernatural beings that drink blood and live forever. Well, what if these supernatural beings that drink blood and live forever aren't dead humans? What if they're fallen angels instead? But that's a whole other talk. Um, 
This is also why Yahweh forbade the drinking of blood. Because as he says, the blood is the life. The life is in the blood. And it's a great curse to drink blood. The children that they had would have been superhuman men of renown because of the angelic side of their nature. But their sin was so grievous that Yahweh drowned the entire world to keep this from proliferating. Some might say, well, this happened a long time ago. This happened, you know, millennia ago. It isn't around today. There's not giants walking around today. Well, that isn't really true. After the flood, the scriptures still freely speak of giants. Goliath, of course, is the best known example. Everybody knows about Goliath. And there's the, we've already mentioned, the Anakim, the Rephaim, all these different races that were in the promised land. And they had to go in there. Why do you think the, the spies that Moses sent into the land, they came back and they were all wimpy and they said, well, they're big and we're like grasshoppers next to them. Well, that was probably a slight contradiction. But yet, you know, I have seen pictures of unearthed skeletons from that region of the earth where there's a thigh bone that's more than 10 feet long. Now, you figure, okay, my thigh bone is probably about two and a half feet long. So if you kind of extrapolate that, you're talking about something that makes Goliath look like a midget. Just enormous beings. Um, finally, there's the verse we already mentioned in the New Testament where Paul cautions about women and angels, how women should keep their heads covered for the sake of the angels. If the angels are no longer being tempted of after Calvary, why bring this up? Then the final point on this is notice what it says in Genesis 6, 4. Then there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. So that's very clearly stating by the author, who I believe was Moses, that even after the flood, there were still occasionally giants running around. These fallen angels are still around today, I believe, using their minds to make up for the lost angelic abilities. Remember, in the old days, before they fell, these angels used to go boing, boing like this and cross the universe. They could leave the throne of the Almighty, which is billions of light years from here, and instantly be here on earth. They had to give all that up when they fell. They are still driven by Satan to interbreed with human beings. But at the same time, they've used their intellect to create literal machines, spaceships, that are capable of human, centuries ahead of human technology. They use their technology to blackmail the government into allowing them to misuse human citizens as they see fit. Their hope is to produce a child who will be the Antichrist and or to produce thousands of people who are programmed to obey him because of abduction experiences. And... Okay, we did that. Many people who have these abduction experiences crave them. They become addicted to them, even though they're scary. Even though, I mean, how would you like to be strapped to a table, unable to move, and having people sticking probes up your ears and stuff? I mean, anybody want to sign up for that one? But some people want it. I've actually talked to people that I say they are praying for it, to be abducted. Because they, you know, these aren't Christians, of course, but they believe it's the next step in the evolution of human consciousness to go through these, the, the, what these experiments are, the aliens are doing, the space brothers, pardon me, are doing are to help us evolve in the next stage of human evolution. This seems to be the theme that this Whitley Strieber has that wrote the book Communion. And he's done so much to um, popularize the abduction uh, phenomenon. Um, they're trying to deceive people into believing that they are indeed benevolent. And a lot of people are buying it. And I don't know how many of you have seen that movie Independence Day, you know, but there's that one scene that is so reminds me of this, where at the beginning of the movie where there's all these wacko people up on top of the skyscraper, there's this enormous UFO that's like bigger than Yankee Stadium right over them, and they're standing there saying, Beam me up, take me, you know, and then this big death ray comes down and, you know, blows up five city blocks. You know, I mean, that's so typical of the mentality of these people. Um, the other thing is, now, now think about this one for a moment. Supposedly, suppose I came up to just a typical person on the street, not a Christian, just some typical unsaved individual, and said, hey, I got a great deal for you. 
How'd you like to have a demon live inside of you? Most people, I think, would probably say, get out of here. <laughs> you know, even if they don't believe in God, even if they don't believe in, you know, I don't want any demons, you know, that sounds too crazy, you know, whatever. Um, but suppose this. Suppose I come up to someone like that and I say, how would you like to have a vast, superior alien intelligence cohabit with you and live with you and talk to you and teach you the wonders of the universe? There's a lot of people who would sign up for that. You know, it sounds pretty good, unless you know your Bible. And this is a phenomenon that's known as walk-ins. There's thousands of people walking around that claim that they have an alien living inside of them, an alien consciousness. I don't think it's literally an alien alien in the sense that they have like some, you know, like what is it, the, 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 the Stargate thing where they have this worm parasite thing living inside of them that's like an alien. Uh, no, not quite like that. This is like demon possession, except it isn't called that. It's been repackaged with Star Trek sci-fi, you know, glitter, and instead they've got this, it's like having Mr. Spock live inside of me, except no pointy ears, you know. So, I mean, the devil is so clever about this. The world is being prepared for this end times deception. And I believe it will involve Jupiter or Orion or both. I would not be surprised if these beings claim to come from Jupiter. That's because in ancient times the planet Jupiter was called Marduk and both Marduk and Orion are associated with Nimrod. And of course Nimrod is the fountainhead of all false religion on this planet. He's the one that started Babylon. And, you know, the other thing too is that, is that Jupiter is the name of the king of the gods. You know, Jove, Zeus, whatever you want to use, whatever term you want to use. And so he is a rival deity to Yahweh. So why wouldn't these beings come from that planet? Now, most Bible students know that Nimrod was the original head of the New World Order back in the days of Babel, and he is the number one type of Antichrist in the whole Old Testament. So, works for me. Now we have the whole abduction phenomenon. The first reported abduction was in 1961. There may have been others before that, but this is the only one we know about. This couple, normal, average people, he was a postal worker. She was a housewife. Uh, he's now since deceased, but I think Betty Hill's still alive. This is Barney and Betty Hill. And they went out for a drive. And they saw a light in the sky, and all of a sudden their engine stopped and they lost two hours. The next thing they knew it was two hours later. And they didn't know what was going on, but they both seemed kind of weirded out and creeped out by the experience. So much so that after I don't know how long, months, maybe even years, they sought out the help of a hypnotist. And he hypnotized them. And the interesting thing is, is that they started speaking of the things we have discussed earlier, the... The idea of being taken aboard this craft by these little gray people that look very weird and spindly and have enormous almond-shaped eyes. Beings that are very terrifying and that you're strapped down and they're doing medical experiments. They're like taking stuff, you know, out of your body. They're putting probes in your nose and in your ears and, you know, just nasty things all together. And the interesting thing, that the thing that really stunned everybody later on is that Betty claims while she was on this table, she saw a star chart. And what's interesting is, is that in this star chart, she said there was X, Y, Z stars. And astronomers looked at that chart and said, well, this doesn't mean anything. Well, 20 or 30 years after this, they have the computer ability now to model constellations. And they said by, by using that software, they were able to turn it around and determine that this is what Earth would look like, the star system of Sol, our solar system, if it was seen from the star system's zeta reticuli. Now that's kind of amazing. So anyhow, this has been a pretty reputable uh, story that's never really been shaken. Essentially, this is how it goes. This is the abduction scenario. People are accosted by aliens, usually in either a deserted area outside or else in their bedrooms. They can't move. They're paralyzed. 
They feel as though someone is levitating them out of the room or else little people are carrying them out of the room or whatever. And they're taken up to this ship. Sometimes they don't even see the ship. Sometimes they just wake up and they're in the ship. And the ship usually is very hard to describe. It has no configurations that are easy to put into words. And they're, they're usually strapped down on a table and experiments are being done to them of a very invasive nature. Blood and other bodily fluids are being extracted from them. There's often an excessive interest in the UFO crew on, in their reproductive organs. If they're women, sometimes they harvest ova from them. If they're men, they take seminal fluid from them. Uh, the person often reports being stored somewhere in a hive-like compartment, sometimes for days on end. The crew communicates with the person with something like telepathy. Often tiny devices are inserted in the person's body. Ears or nasal passages are the most common places. The person is usually abandoned by the crew at or near their place of abduction with their memory wiped clean. The person may not have any conscious knowledge of this until months or years later. But they have unexplained scars, memory flashes, nightmares, etc. Some women report hysterical pregnancies. I don't know if you've heard of that, but it's where a woman has all the manifestations of pregnancy, but no baby comes out. And some people believe that's because they, they actually put, they impregnate these women either through artificial insemination or whatever, and then when the baby is about to come to term, they beam the baby out. So there's no, you know, there's no trace of either a cesarean section or a normal, you know, vaginal delivery. Um, other women have carried children to term. This happened to one person we prayed for. She had the baby. They said, oh, it's stillborn. And they whisked it out of the room. They never let her see it. That was on a military hospital in Germany, by the way. This stuff often is related to people who are in the military or their children, you know, children of military people. Um, none of these women had any conscious knowledge of who the father could be. Many of them, in fact, thought they were still virgins. Once these people came forward in the story, they often found themselves followed or hassled by the dread men in black in their ancient black Cadillacs. These are very strange looking creatures. They appear to be human, except they look Asian. And they smell like sulfur or ozone. They wear dark glasses, black suits, and Hamburg hats. And they talk with a kind of strange metallic quality. And they often threaten people who are talking about UFOs. They tell them, you'll lose your job, you'll be ridiculed, the government will come and take you away, whatever it might be. And they drive off in their Cadillacs, which are invariably reported to be absolutely silent. Even though they look like a, you know, a 1958 caddy, they don't make any noise, just like that, you know. What is the physical appearance of these beings? Well, I've already alluded to this first kind. This is a, the supposed gray alien, which come, they say, from Zeta Recticuli. And these are really disgusting little creatures. They run from three to four feet tall. They smell like sulfur or feces. Uh, they walk kind of monkey-like. They don't seem to have any speech. They communicate entirely by telepathy. They don't have any, they, they often are running around without clothes on. If they wear clothes, they wear kind of a skin-tight, silver lame jumpsuit. And you know what the insignia they wear is it? On it? It's like a staff with a serpent on it. Isn't that interesting? So anyway, it, it, they normally don't appear to have any external genitalia, nor do they appear to eat. Reports we've had is that they've been seen. They have like these big pools of blood, like a big vat of blood or a big vat of some green stuff like chlorophyll, and they stick their fingers in it and, you know, see, Mork isn't the only one that eats like that. <laughs> you see, where do they get this stuff? They put this stuff on TV, but, you know, these are the ones that are also most commonly seen in abductions. They're the ones that are doing all of the legwork. The second kind of alien. These are known as the Nordics, the blondes, or the gods from outer space. And these look idealized blonde humans. Very, very beautiful, very, very handsome, 
taller than normal, but not like gigantically tall. And they are supposedly from the constellation Lyra. And they are said to be from Space Command. <clears throat> and they're the good guys. They're held to help us protect us from the little gray guys. This is the story out there in UFO land. The problem is, is that the prime directive doesn't allow them to help us, really. They can just sort of stand around and give us advice, but they can't really do anything. So, okay. Anyway, but you never see them typically involved in abduction scenarios. Quite often, they're the ones that actually walk around in broad daylight and appear quite normal, except they, they unfortunately tend to wear silver lame jumpsuits, which sort of makes them stand out a little, but otherwise they look perfectly human. In fact, they look too perfectly human. Then we have the dread men in black. I've already kind of, um, of uh, described these, so I'm not going to um, go into it. But uh, I just want to tell you that they don't look like Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones. Uh, the movies are, that those movies are based on a comic book. And, you know, there's, there's just tiny shreds of truth, but most of it is just, you know, total comedy for the sake of, you know, the movie going public. But again, this is intended to acclimate people, to familiarize people. So if you see someone coming up to you, you know, dressed like that, you're, oh, wow, cool, it's Will Smith, you know, whatever. Um, then we have the reptilian. These supposedly from, come from the constellation Draco. And as some of you may know, Draco is the Latin word for dragon. It's the dragon that's in the heavens. These are carnivorous, cannibalistic, and seven feet tall. They exist at the top of the alien food chain. They like to eat people. The tenderer, the better. They also will eat other aliens if they're hungry and the mood strikes them. Uh, these are very, very cruel and very, very nasty but supposedly they are the administrators. They are the people running things behind the show. And they have been recently cited, and by recently I'm relatively like the last 20 or 30 years, uh, by numerous people, myself included. And they're not something you'd want to run into in a dark alley. And again, some of you may remember the old TV miniseries V, where they have these huge ships, you know, coming down. And uh, what happened? You know, they look just like us except they wore these funny red jumpsuits. But ultimately, you discover they were wearing masks. They take off the masks and they're lizards that like to eat live mice, at least. Now, the big question everybody wants to know is this. Can believers be abducted? Well, in my opinion, the answer would be a qualified yes. Many believers have reported being assaulted in their homes by aliens and repelling them by using the name of Yeshua. By the way, we prefer to use Yeshua just because that's his real Hebrew name. Nobody, when he walked the earth, called him Jesus. The angel that came to Mary did not say, and you shall call his name Jesus. His name is Yahshua, which is neat because it means Yah, which is the name of the Almighty Father, saves. Or Yah is salvation, depending on how you translate it. So it's a wonderful name. We prefer to use that. Anyway, others say they have used the divine name to no effect and were still abducted. And both of these people were solid believers. Now that's interesting. What do you do with that information? Oops. Um, here's what I think. I think the fact of the matter is it does not have to do anything with the goodliness of the person. Open doors might be an issue in some cases. By open doors, I don't mean they left their front door open. I mean, we, those of us that deal in liberation or deliverance type ministries understand that there are certain things that can be like either a sinful lifestyle or maybe even something in the home. Like, you know, for example, we have this one case where... Uh, a family's daughter was being horribly attacked by demons. Nothing could be done. Pastors, ministers, psychiatrists, nothing worked. Uh, we came and um, the senior guy who was in our group at that time who really was very, very moving in the gifts of the Spirit, he was led to walk around the room. 
and he found this lady had a spoon collection. And one of the spoons had a little tiny demon face on it. He threw the spoon out the window and the kid was instantly set free. That's an example of an open door. You know, where it's relatively benign. It's not like you're deliberately doing something nasty. I mean, nobody would have even thought of that, you know. But yet the Lord pointed in that direction. So that's one possibility. But we must remember that bad stuff can happen to good Christians. They might be robbed, murdered, or persecuted and still be righteous. They can be injured and killed in natural disasters. I'm sure there were some Christians that were killed in Katerina. I'm sure there were, you know, Katrina, I'm sorry, there were Christians that were killed in the tornadoes that hit in Indiana a few days ago. You know, just because we're Christians, that doesn't mean we're bulletproof. So if that's true of natural disasters, why shouldn't it be true of something like this? Remember that these abductions are often a physical phenomenon. Some may be spiritual in nature. They're a deception. But some are undeniably physical. They leave behind marks on the body. The evidence is found in the home. By that I mean there might be scuff marks on a windowsill or an open door or little wet, weird-looking footprints going from the window to the bed. Imagine waking up in the morning and finding out that your entire lower body is wet and full of grass and stuff. You didn't even think you left your bed and you look down on the floor and there's these little strange footprints that look like nothing you've ever seen in your life. It would tend to creep you out, don't you think? Uh, also, sometimes implants are found. We're going to talk about that in a couple minutes. Uh, then finally, third parties sometimes witness the abduction. I was talking to a very solid Baptist preacher I know. He's pastor of a big church. And... Uh, he said he was out ministering to someone, sick call type thing, and he was driving through this neighborhood where it happened another one of his congregation members lived, and he saw this UFO hovering about 200 feet away from the house, and he actually saw the window open and a body floating out the window, going right up through the air just that slow and going into the UFO. And this guy was stone sober. I mean, you know, Baptists aren't into drinking, amen? <laughs> so, I mean, and this guy has an uh, impeccable reputation. I don't think he'd ever... And then, then later on, the congregation members said they had had weird nightmares and had woken up with all these strange marks on their bodies, bruises they didn't know where they came from, had nosebleeds, and eventually an implant came out of the nose. Now, what are these implants? Well, they can be any number of things. They can be little metallic beads. They can be little cylinders. They can be almost organic looking. Uh, they're usually very, very tiny. They're much tinier. You've all, I'm sure, seen these things about these RFID chips and, you know, embedded chips and all of that where they're, you know, they're pretty small, but these things are much smaller. And um, what we tell people to do is pray and ask the Holy Spirit to remove these things, either by destroying them or by having the body expel them. And in most cases, either the person wakes up, there's blood on the pillow, and there's this little tiny thing there, either metallic or of indeterminate origin, or it emerges out of their body, like you, they get this weird sore or welt somewhere, and then the next couple of days, out comes this strange-looking thing. And... Um, this is an actual implant that was recovered. Now, uh, you don't do it, it oddly enough, this is, we went, actually went to a biology department at a local college and got this blown up because actually it's smaller than a sesame seed. And the first thing I thought was, it looks like a chicken McNugget. <laughs> but what's funny is, and I don't know if you can even see this on the screen, but up in the upper left, there are a couple of little black things. Now, this implant is 20 years old. It, it came out of a Christian 20 years ago. There's two little black things. And those little black things were originally, they had little tentacles coming out of them. Little kind of feeler thingies. And those broke off over the years. I mean, because they were very, very tiny. And I'm sure once this thing was out of the body, it kind of, you know, dried up like any organism would. But 
I asked the guy at the bio, he says, I said, what is this? And he says, well, he said, bleeped if I know. <laughs> that was his candid answer. He said, I've never seen anything like this. You know, he, he magnified it even further. He said, it's, it's not a seed. It doesn't, it appears to be a biological thing, but yet it's not. So, anyhow, that's a real live implant. I tried to find another one, but we're in the process of repacking stuff, and I couldn't locate it. But this is one of two that we actually have. Now, back to the question. Am I an abductee? Well, first of all, some of you may have heard this, but I'll, I have, I'll say it again. We had the thing where I was studying with the Arch Druid the Grand Master Druid of North America down in Arkansas. Sharon and I were down there, and every night we'd be on the mountaintop sitting at a picnic table learning all these weird things about how to, you know, be a druid. And about half the nights we were there, especially it was clear, this UFO would come sailing in, quiet as can be, and hover over the mountaintop for the entire class. And it was like 200 feet above us. I mean, I could actually look up and so could the other people and see windows in the thing. And sometimes we'd see little weird figures walking around in those windows, and sometimes they'd even go like this, you know. And then when the class was over, just as silent as a whisper, it would, you know, glide away. And it wasn't like a dirigible or something, because we could see the stars beyond it. It was sort of basically cigar-shaped. And, you know... This druid who was teaching us would never say what it was. He wouldn't comment on it. We'd talk about it among ourselves, but none of us had the nerve to ask him because he wouldn't say anything. And then there's a time in Wauwatosa a few years later when I was told by my spirit guides to go out in the middle of January at midnight when it was like 20 below zero and walk through this park by the Menominee River, I think it was. And... You know, I walked there and this brilliantly colored oval thing came down out of the sky. It looked like a thing of pure light. And it came very, like within a hundred feet of me, and then all of a sudden it just like that enveloped me. And the next thing I know, I was inside of this thing. But this wasn't your typical abduction experience by any means. I was standing there before like this panel of five or six somethings. I mean, some of them looked perfectly human. They said they had kind of strange robes on, but some of them looked very non-human. And the odd thing was, is that they started asking me questions. And they were mainly asking me questions about masonry. Now, isn't that interesting? And they wanted to know how well I knew the Masonic Catechism I'd been taught. And so I actually had to give this back and forth thing that masons are required to learn before they go up to the next level of the lodge. And then, at the end of it, there was no further comment. The next thing I know, I'm laying on my back in the snow in this park in Wauwatosa, and it's about an hour and a half later. And I was just a little bit cold, so I knew I hadn't been laying there the whole time, or I would have been half frozen. Then the other thing is that I was drawn so quickly and so deeply into a Nakian and Thalamic magic. And these are two very advanced kinds of magic that involve how shall I put this, transpatial relationships where you are opening up doorways into other dimensions and you're inviting beings from other dimensions through. And some of these beings were pretty scary. Uh, all I can tell you is one time my wife and I and some of our coven members, we went down to the shores of Lake Michigan in the middle of the night when the moon was full and we did a call to Kulu. Now, Thulu is one of the great old gods of the trans magical system. And, you know, this thing came up out of the sea that was taller than a skyscraper. And if you want to know what it looked like, pretty darn close, and you can stand the movie, there's this movie that just came out recently on video called Hellboy. And in the end of that movie, they have this thing that comes through and I tell you, it's about 80% similar to the thing we conjured up out of Lake Michigan. And supposedly this is a god from another dimension who is far older than the god of our dimension, which, of course, is bunk, but that's the story. 
So, I mean, you know, that kind of magical stuff was very, very potent. We would actually look through these rips in the fabric of time and see galaxies and see other dimensions. Then we, I think many of you have heard the story of my being taken to one of the moons of Saturn out of my bedroom back in Iowa when I was probably in my late 20s and taken into this place called the Cathedral of Pain where Lucifer came to me and put a talon right through the, the middle of my third eye and left a scar which is still visible to this day and told me I belonged to him forever. And then I was cast out of that cathedral, which was a horrible place, back down to earth in a pillar of fire, landed in the backyard of my home. Fortunately, it was summertime, no clothing on. I landed in the backyard with a blaze of fire, and there was a ring of burning fire in the lawn around me. And so people say, were well, you doing drugs? <laughs> well, yes, but not at that particular evening. And it's hard to explain, you know, drugs when you've got, you know, like this, like meteor crater in your backyard. I'm, I'm glad I, I left early that morning before my folks got up and said, what happened in the backyard, you know? And then there was the fact that I would, both Sharon and I, when we were driving out to Utah to be married in the temple for time and all eternity, we were continually buzzed by UFOs, especially once we got into the Utah desert. Because let me tell you, you get out in those deserts, like Utah and, and um, Nevada, uh, Four Corners region, Arizona, New Mexico, there's some very strange stuff out there, really strange. The Panamint Mountains, some of those regions. Uh, I mean, even the Native American people for centuries have reported, you know, that there are strange things going on within those mountains. That brings us to underground bases. How's that for a smooth segue? Uh, a key component of understanding how all this fits into the end time plan is the idea that there has been a collusion between our government and the Bnei Elohim, the sons of God. Uh, treaties were entered by the Eisenhower administration back in the 1950s where deals were made that basically uh, we would get a lot of advanced technology from these aliens, stuff like, you know, Velcro and Teflon and, you know, microchips or whatever. And it is interesting to note how technology just expanded geometrically after the 1950s. I heard one scientist give a lecture where he said that we have had more scientific discoveries since the late 1950s than since between the 1950s and the time of Yeshua. Just think of that, because I mean, that's almost all of our lifetimes. Think of all the stuff we've seen. You know, I remember my grandmother saying, she was born in 1888, and she says, I can remember as a girl, you know, being ridden to school in a buckboard, and I lived to see men walking on the moon. You know, I mean, that's pretty extraordinary when you think of it. And she was, you know, she lived to be 96 or 97, but I mean, she was, she was like in her 80s at that point. So anyhow, we get supposedly all this technology and in return, the aliens, whatever they are, the B'nai Elohim, get to experiment on a few of our citizens. You know, pull them up in the spacecraft. Oh, they also get to kill a few hundred cattle here and there and cut out their innards. But that's another talk. Anyway, um, so... The other thing they get is they got the right to build these underground bases. And then they would share them with us. And you know how the government is about acronyms. You know, CIA, FBI, NSA, da 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 Well, they had to call these DUMBs. Deep Underground Military Bases. D-U-M-B. <laughs> I hope they fired whoever came up with that one. Anyhow, this is supposed to be a joint effort between the military and our aliens. And what happened is, is the aliens gave us the technology to build this, it's called a subterrane. And basically it moves through the earth at five miles an hour. And it's got some kind of thing that's like a laser, but a hundred times powerful in the front of it that burns this circular thing that's about just a little bit bigger than, say, you could drive a train through this big cylinder, and it moves, and with this you can, well, you know, five miles an hour, you could, you know, make some good progress. 
and it melts the rock so that when it comes out the other end, it's as smooth as can be, just like volcanic glass. Don't believe me? There's a picture of one. That's a U.S. Air Force submarine. And um, basically, these tunnels honeycomb the southwest, especially. But they're even in this part of the country, they often are connected to old U.S. military missile silos or even not so old military silos. Uh, but I know they're especially strong in the, in the southwest, the Four Corners region. And there, there are bases that are up to five miles deep beneath us, entire cities down there. And um, in fact, I, I know there's this one fellow who has since been murdered, <laughs> but he, he was actually a, a worker. He was a military worker in the, one of these bases. And the aliens were supposed to keep to the lowest level. And the humans are supposed to keep to the upper levels. But apparently some alien made a mistake. And this guy said he was on an elevator riding from whatever level to whatever level. And all, you know, the elevator, ding, you know, the door is open. And in walks this, you know, seven foot tall lizard in a lab coat and, and a black tie. You know, complete with pocket protector. <laughs> and he just, you know, what do you do? You know, kind of how you... You know, what do you do when you're in an elevator with a seven-foot-tall lizard? You hope he's not hungry, you know. And uh, the guy just totally freaked. As and, and they said later on the lizard was demoted for doing that. But anyhow, uh, let's see, he was a reptilian. And what happened is, is it ended up that the, the military discovered that the aliens were not keeping their part of the treaty. Big surprise. You know, the devil's a liar. And a deceiver. Whoops. And so, what happened? An underground war broke out. And we tried to take back some of the levels of this, uh, of this under, these underground bases. And it was a horrible slaughter. Thousands of people were killed and probably a fair number of aliens as well, but they had superior technology. Some people claim that the underground nuclear testing that we were doing, some of you may remember that in Nevada, I think that was in the 60s, uh, that that was actually a cover-up for us detonating underground nuclear warheads to try and kill some of these aliens. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's, that, that's what is alleged. And as a result of that, especially in the Four Corners region, in Dulce, that area, that has now been totally given over to the aliens. And if you go down there, man, you're lunch. So nobody goes down there anymore. And also, these same aliens have been seen elsewhere. Of all places, they're seen in a mall in Salt Lake City. After closing hours, this mall, it was one block from the Salt Lake Temple. In the heart of downtown Salt Lake City, this cleaning lady comes around the corner with her bucket and mop, and she sees this giant lizard standing there in a lab coat with a clipboard. You know, what do you do? She shrieked and ran one way. He went Bark! and ran the other way because he wasn't supposed to be seen. And, you know, there's, there's so many reports, this, including I've, I've had a couple of encounters with these things, which I'd rather not discuss because they're very disgusting. But uh, these things are real, believe me. And they also have a very bad... You know, have you ever been in a... In a like a, a, the snake house in a zoo. That's what these things smell like. I mean, the smell is very real and it's very disgusting. Okay, one thing you need to understand before we get to the final part of this. And that's the idea of the celestial council. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, there's, there's a whole panoply of celestial beings up there. That's why I prefer to call them celestial beings because it's a broader designation than angel. First of all, there are angels, the melachim, the messengers. Then secondarily, we have the chief angels, the archangels. Now, Hebrew lore says there's seven of them, but only two are mentioned in the Bible, Michael and, and Gabriel. And of course, uh, some people, Gabriel is never specifically called an archangel, but a lot of Bible scholars um, identify him 
with the angel that blows the trumpet in 1 Thessalonians 4.16. It talks about the trump of the archangel. And that's why Gabriel is now associated with a trumpet. That may not even be right, but it's, it's a popular little tradition that's come down through the years. Additionally, we have Raphael, who's the angel of healing. He's out of the apocryphal book of Tobias. We have Uriel, uh, who is the earth angel. He's in charge of the earth. And then there's also three other angels whose names escape me. But those are the seven angels. Again, only two of them are actually in the Bible, so there's only two. But you see in, I think it's in one of the apocryphal books, Raphael it is, Raphael, and you see the word Rapha in there, which means healer. His name means God heals, El heals. And uh, anyway, he says, I am Raphael, one of seven who stand before the Lord. And that's where this idea, which is again not in the scripture, it's in the, uh, the, that's in the apocryphal books that are in the Catholic Bible, but not in our Bible. Um, anyway, that's where this idea of seven archangels comes from. Then we have the seraphim. These are the most awesome of all angelic beings. And, and though it doesn't really say this in the Bible, most people feel they are the highest order of angels. They are so brilliant and so powerful. The name itself means flaming ones, or oddly enough, flaming serpents. And all they do is, is fly before the throne of God day and night singing what is commonly called the Trisagion, the thrice holy. Kadosh, 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 Yahweh, Kavod, Melecho, Haretz. You know, holy, 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 Yahweh Elohim of hosts. And night and day, and they have six wings. And with two they fly, and with two they cover their faces, and with two they cover their feet. And this, this is right in the scripture, this is in Isaiah. And... You know, that's because of their, they're so holy, but they're also so awestruck because they are right up against the face, as it's called, pen al, the face of Elohim, that they actually cover their faces out of awe and out of respect. And they just sing this day and night, forever and ever. And they never leave his presence except once. And that's what's really strange. Because if you understand the Hebrew, you know that one scene when the, um, the Israelites were complaining in the wilderness and Yahweh sent, it says, fiery serpents among them and whoever was bitten by those serpents died and then he told Moshe to raise up this staff with the brazen serpent on it, which is a type of Christ. And anyone who looked upon that serpent would be healed. Well, the Hebrew word for that is the same word that's used for seraphim. So for whatever reason, the Almighty got really honked off at the Israelites at that point and sent his most powerful angels down there to trouble them. But normally they never leave the throne. Speaking of the throne, we have the cherubim or cherubim. These are the four living creatures. Uh, the word means one who prays or one who intercedes. And it, it is believed that these, there are originally five of them. We'll talk about that in a second. It is believed by most Bible scholars that originally there were five of them. And four of them were the actual throne upon which Yahweh sat. And the other the one, the fifth one, covered him. Now, does that ring a bell with anybody? Lucifer is described in Ezekiel 28 as being the anointed cherub who covereth. Now think of this. If you look at how the, the cherubim are described in the book of Ezekiel and in the book of Revelations, what do we got? We've got one with the face of a man, one with the face of an ox, one with the face of an eagle, and one with the face of a lion. What does that mean? Well, there's a couple things it means. For one thing, they symbolize different kingdoms on earth. For example, obviously the human kingdom. Then you have the eagle. That's the kingdom of the birds of the air. Then you have the ox. That's the kingdom of domesticated animals. And you have the lion. That's the kingdom of wild animals. 
What's left? Reptiles and fish, which a lot of times in biblical lore you will see the two kind of intermingled. Uh, what I believe is that, is that Lucifer was originally the fifth cherub who covered, and he was the cherub of the reptile kingdom, just like the others were the cherubim of the other kingdoms. And that's why after he fell, he took a serpent and somehow possessed it so the serpent could speak and talk to Eve and tempt her. It's because he had that natural affinity with the serpent kingdom. Some people actually teach that if you believe in this, I don't know, this is one of those things Christians argue about. We, we love to argue about stuff, don't we? Anyway, the idea of the, the pre-Adamic creation. Some people believe that Lucifer was given a throne and a kingdom before man came on the earth. And that's why in Isaiah 14, what does he say there? He says, I will lift up my throne and ascend to the heights. He already had a throne. He was the king of the earth. And some people believe that his kingdom was a race of intelligent reptilians, which we now see as dinosaur fossils. Just something to think about. I'm not saying that's gospel or anything, but it is because a lot of people who, you know, you know, are, are trying to fight the whole evolution thing, Christians get themselves all tied up in a knot with the whole dinosaur thing. Were there dinosaurs? Weren't there dinosaurs? I know there's, I heard this one sweet Christian lady say, oh, well, you know, Satan just put all those bones there to confuse us. There really weren't dinosaurs. The earth is really only 6,000 years old. And I believe the earth is only 6,000 years old, but I'm not sure I believe that. You know, because there may have been stuff going on before that. Because it is interesting, and I don't know what you folks believe or are taught about this, but it does say there in Genesis, he commands Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. How can you replenish something that first hasn't been plenished, if you'll pardon my fracturing the English language? The other interesting thing is that same word, both in English and Hebrew, is used to Noah after the flood. Yahweh says to him, go and replenish the earth. The other thing is, is that you'll notice in Genesis 1, what does it say? It says, the earth was without form and void. The Hebrew there is tohu bohu. And, and, you know, but it says Yahweh makes everything good. Why would he make an earth that's like this big glop of formless nothingness? Unless Satan ruined it or unless there was a previous flood that is only alluded to in the Bible. And it is alluded to in the Bible, in the book of Second Peter. Ever noticed that? It talks about there, he's talking about how people are scoffers. They say that things have been as the world was from the beginning. And, and then there's this one very strange passage that people forget that when the earth was in the water and out of the water and in the water. So it sounds like the earth got baptized twice. Once to get rid of Satan's kingdom, and wants to get rid of the Nephilim in Genesis 6. Just some interesting suggestions. So anyway, my point was, is that if that's the case, then Satan, or Lucifer as he was known, actually his real name is Hallel, which means bright, shining one. That was, that was the name in the Hebrew. But Lucifer, when he fell, he took the, the reptilian kingdom with him, and that's part of the reason why there's such a Kind of about serpents. I mean, most people don't like lizards and snakes and crocodiles. Aside from that, they eat you. But I mean, other than that, I mean, it, it, it's just most people. I mean, oh, I'll tell you, we used to have a um, several pet snakes when we were witches, and in fact, we had a six and a half foot boa constrictor. And I'll never forget one time, not one of the best nights of our life. It was right after we'd just done a an equinox ritual in Milwaukee. And some nutball from the cult of Guru Maharaji threw a firebomb into our temple. Hey, you try having a firebomb thrown to your temple, <laughs> you know. It was pretty, we were sitting around after the feast, kind of talking and having some wine and just socializing. And all of a sudden, boom, you know, because it was up in the attic, you see. And anyhow, of course, the first thing Sharon did was go and get her pet snake. 
you know, that's what you do. You get the living things out first and then you take care of your property. And it was so funny because she still had on this long black robe from the, from the ritual. And, of course, you know how fires all the neighborhood people gather around. And she comes down, you know, she has long black hair. And she comes down the stairs with this giant snake wrapped around. And I'm wearing a scarlet robe because that's what the high priest wears. And we had this one fellow who was in our coat. I felt so sorry for him. He was, this, he was a fairly respect. I think he was a doctor. And he was so freaked out by that, he never came back. Just that, you know, that had happened. And, you know, I think he was afraid that someone might find out he was a witch, you know. So anyway, um, I mean, snakes are amazing animals. But I really don't want to be around them anymore. Um, anyway. So the other part about these four beings is this. Uh, they're associated with the four brightest stars in the heavens, these four cherubim. And also the four corners of the zodiac. Some of you may know this. Uh, the, the four signs, the, I think they're the cardinal signs of the zodiac. Aquarius, the man. Taurus, the ox. Um, Leo, the lion. And the Scorpio is the eagle. Now, I'm not saying that astrology is true. But how many of you realize there is a true biblical way of looking at astrology? Not like, oh, you know, who am I going to marry? And it's some kind of weird predictive thing or whatever. But the gospel is in the stars. And here's how it breaks down if you're interested. The man-faced cherub goes with Fomalhaut in the council in Aquarius. The lion-faced cherub goes with Regulus, which is the constellation of Leo. The serpent-faced cherub goes with Antares in Opiuchus, who is the serpent or, or eagle, and finally, the ox-faced cherub goes with Aldebaran in the constellation of Taurus, who is, of course, the bull. Okay. What's interesting is that all these stars are regarded as gateways. Now, I know some people teach that stars are angels. And that might also be true. But in the occult... And in the world of UFOs, these are actually regarded as gateways into other dimensions. So Aldebaran, for example, is a gateway into the realm of Taurus, and so on and so on. You get the idea. So these are actually things you can target. And so like, for example, when I was a witch, I would astrally project and I would actually go into these constellations and use them as ways to get through various paths to do various magical things. Then we get to the next thing. There's these various other high-level celestial beings. Thrones. Some people think thrones are the same as cherubim. Principalities, powers, world rulers. The Greek word that's used in Ephesians 6.12 is archons. And these are all very high-level beings. I personally believe they, and I think this is a fairly common teaching among people who are into this sort of thing, that these are beings that are over cities and that are over nation-states. That, that America has a archon, a principality or a power over itself, as do all nations. Also, I believe that, that major religions have principalities over them. You know, Mormonism, Buddhism, whatever. That they all have angels, either good or bad, over them. And obviously, if they're a false religion then it's got to be a bad angel or a bad archon or whatever you want to call it. Just like the nation of Israel has Mikhail. He's the great prince of the people of Israel. And he is their defender. Of course, what does Mikhail mean in Hebrew? Who is like God? Because that was the battle cry. See, when, when Satan rebelled, when Lucifer rebelled in heaven, and he says, I will take my throne. I will be like the Most High. El Elyon in the Hebrew. I will ascend. Well, what happened? It says that the dragon and his angels fought, and Mikhail and his angels fought, and the dragon was cast out of heaven. And so it was like Mikhail's very name was saying, who could be compared to our God, our El, our Elohim, Mikhail. Who dares to say they are like Yahweh? That's basically what his name means. And it should be our battle cry as well. An interesting side note 
about the Archangel Michael. He's regarded in, in Anglican and Catholic circles as the patron saint of exorcists and of people who deal with the devil and who fight the devil. And there's a prayer which I had to learn as a little child. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Notice here we're praying to an angel. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be thou our defense against the snares of the devil. You know, may thou rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly host, thrust him into hell with Satan and all the other evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. I said that to say this. If you go over to England, there's a very interesting church that's dedicated to St. Michael. And it's in Glastonbury. Have you ever heard of Glastonbury? It's this little town in western England where it's alleged that the Holy Grail was, where Arthur was buried, and it's, it's also alleged that Joseph of Arimathea came there with 12 disciples of Yeshua and set up the first above-ground Christian church in history. A little wattle church. And it's alleged that he put his stake in the ground and that it blossomed. And to this day, that's called the Glastonbury Thorn Rose. Anyway, there's this place called Glastonbury Tor. Now, a tor is an old uh, Gaelic word. It means like a hillside. And it's this, it looks artificial. It's this very high hill. It goes up like this and it slopes down. And it was a place of pagan worship. So you know what they did? A few centuries later, when the Roman church came in, they decided to build a St. Michael church on top of this tor, which was the holiest place in all England, according to the pagans. And anyhow, they built it and they dedicated it to St. Michael. And on the first Michaelmas, which is the Feast of St. Michael, that's what they call it over in England, after that church was built, the Tor experienced an earthquake and it flattened the entire church except for one part, the tower. And that tower still stands to this day. Now think about that when you realize what a tower symbolizes. It's a symbol of the phallic god. So it's sort of like, you know, even though the, the Catholics were trying to invoke St. Michael and all these other angels. See, you don't need to mess with angels. Go to the top. Deal with the Almighty. Don't deal with middle-level management when you can reach the CEO. Amen? But anyway, I, and when we went over there, it was really interesting. As we drove around and we could see this, all, this, is this naked hill with this one single tower on it dedicated to Michael. So anyway, the, this is the Celestial Council. Now, why am I talking about this? Well, it's important to understand this in the light of all this stuff about UFOs and the B'nai Elohim. There's the riddle of Psalm 82. I know a lot of Christians have wrestled with that psalm over the years. For example, it says in Psalm 82, God, this is verse 1, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. Now look at this. I mean, it says right in the Ten Commandments, I am Yahweh the Elohim, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And yet here we're talking about gods. And then in the sixth verse it says, and this is the verse Yeshua quotes in the New Testament, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. So obviously whoever these gods are, they aren't, they aren't on the best side of the Almighty. And if you read the whole psalm in context, this is talking about very high level world rulers, celestial beings of a spiritual nature. These are divine beings, but they're not Yahweh. There are, there are beings, celestial beings, that are partakers of the divine nature just like we are. How many of you realize we are partakers of the divine nature? Peter tells us that right in his epistle. So we have this council of gods. And what's interesting is if you look in that first verse in Hebrew, it says, this is how confusing it would be, Elohim judges among the Elohim. 
because there's no capital letters in Hebrew. Amen? <laughs> so you, they, uh, we put that in there in English, you know, just to think that this is the Elohim. And of course, you all understand Elohim is plural, right? It's a masculine noun with a plural ending. So right there, there's the, the idea of, of God being echad, being one, but it also being three. And that's right in the, in the Torah. I want to introduce you to Michael Heiser. He has done some groundbreaking work, which got him kicked out of one seminary. So you know he's on the right track, amen? Uh, in terms of proving that there is indeed a divine council in heaven. He's an Aramaic scholar, uh, expert in, in Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek. And he also really has a love of the truth. And he has done some very excellent... He has a website. Uh, I refer you to him. I recommend him very highly. I got to meet him personally for the first time at this Roswell conference I was at in July. But he, is, he has looked into the Hebrew and how it's used. He's looked into the ancillary literature of the time that surrounds it. And if you read his stuff, and some of it might be a little bit overly academic, but I can tell you, he knows wherever he speaks. And what's important about his work is that you need to understand that there are these divine beings out there that were part of the heavenly council that are extremely powerful and that some of these beings have fallen. Because what that psalm is talking about, if you read the whole psalm, 82, is that they are oppressing the poor. They are not judging rightly among the poor. Yahweh gave these, these celestial beings authority over certain parts of humanity and they were abusing their people. They were allowing the poor to be victimized. And so he's saying unto them that, you know, even though thou art gods, you will fall like the princes and die like men. And again, the wages of sin is what? Death. So even these beings can die. Although that's very rare. So anyhow, I really, he also has a very interesting fictional book whose name totally went out of my mind at this moment. <laughs> but I'm sure you can find it if, if you go online. Anyhow, it's, it's a novel which is a barely fictionalized account of some of his experiences in the world of academia. And he has a very intriguing hypothesis about cattle mutilations. And uh, basically, he believes that the a he, he, in the book, and he doesn't necessarily really believe this, but I think it's a very interesting hypothesis that the aliens are using cattle to terraform the earth. Now, what do I mean by that? What's terraforming? It means to change the face of a planet. Now, how would you do that? Well, here's the thing. In the book, he hypothesizes, and again, this is just fiction, that these aliens breathe an atmosphere that is richer in methane than we do. Now, I'm sure some of you, if you've lived on a farm, if you've been around farmers, you know that cows <clears throat> burp a lot and they suffer from very bad flatulence. And it has often been said that if one could find a way to do it, like put a glass dome over a herd of cows, you could connect enough, collect enough methane to run your farm to eat your farm. Well, anyhow, his hypothesis is that the aliens are experimenting on our cattle. Because think how many millions of head of cattle are on the world. And just tweaking their DNA to make them slightly more <coughs> gaseous. Because people don't realize how wonderfully and perfectly designed this planet is. If there is even 1% more methane in this atmosphere, most life on it would be dead. Just like that. And then the aliens could move in and have a perfectly acceptable planet. So his little idea that he floats in this book is that, and he's not saying he believes this, is that, the, that, that they're just tweaking the DNA of the, alien, of the um, cattle enough to make them burp and pass gas more. And that would end up gradually over a period of 20 or 30 years killing everyone on Earth and they could take it over without firing a shot. A kind of bizarre form of biological warfare. I think the guy has a great sense of humor, frankly. <laughs> Anyhow, he's a really good brother in the Lord. I recommend his work very highly. 
So what's the reptilian agenda? And I have to tell you, this is not a real reptilian. This is a thing from Jurassic Park. But uh, some people who have seen these aliens, and I would agree, say they look just like velociraptors in the movie Jurassic Park. And they act about the same way. So these once divine beings now resemble their new father, the devil. And they seek to mingle the DNA of fallen angels with humanity. And as a result of this, Satan hopes to corrupt humanity even as he did before the flood. And this is very important to understand because if they can corrupt us to the point that we, not we in this room, but we as a race are so full of fallen DNA, angel DNA, that we can no longer accept Christ. We can no longer make a decision for Christ because our wills have been so corrupted by this sort of thing. You're talking about a very dangerous situation here for humanity. They want to mingle fallen angel DNA with our DNA. And they do this by seducing women because, again, they can assume very attractive human forms. In fact, one of the, you know, it's funny, I, I get all these strange emails from people. I don't know if you've heard of this David Icke, but he, he's this guy who totally hates, you know, the gospel, the master, everything. But he's big on this reptilian thing. He's like totally dedicated to the reptilian thing. He claims that the royal family are all reptilians. He claims that Prince Charles is a reptilian. And I said, frankly, I think that they could do better than that in terms of shape-shifting than Prince Charles, you know. But anyhow, that's a side note. Uh, some of what the guy says is true. It is interesting that down through the centuries, dragons have been repeatedly used as a symbol of power. For example, we, we were there when we were over in London doing ministry. If you drive into the city of London, you know what the city of London is? It's not the city of London. It's what we call like Wall Street. They call it the city. And it's like this interior little enclave within London where all the financial bigwigs are, all the big bankers, all of the movers and shakers, just like we have Wall Street. Well, anyhow, right at the entrance to the city of London are two giant black sculptures of reared-up dragons. Isn't that interesting? And, of course, some of you may know the symbol of the kingdom of Wales is a dragon. And, of course, the famous King Arthur... You know what his last name was? Pendragon, which means son of the dragon. And of course, there's also Draculia, whose name means son of the dragon in Romanian. It's funny how often you see these dragons being used for stuff like this. But they can also assume human form and seduce women. Or they can even, there's some women who want to come to them and have sex with them even as, as lizards, which to me is you know, way beyond kinky, but we won't even go there. The other thing they do is they abduct and or rape women, either the typical UFO abduction or else satanic ritual context. As many people have seen these lizard-type beings in satanic rituals and assumed, probably rightly, that they were um, fallen angels. Excuse me. The other thing they're going to do, and I know this was discussed when I was involved with all this wicked stuff 20, 30 years ago, they want to get fallen angel DNA into the blood supply through certain vaccines. And we all know there's already a lot of nasty stuff in those vaccines. But black magic and black science may have generated the HIV strain. See, back in the late 70s, when I was involved with some very wicked people, they were doing high-level occult magic to produce something very like the AIDS virus. I don't know if they're responsible for it, but you see, when you put black... And I don't know if you know what I mean by black science. I'm not meaning African-American scientists. Black science is undercover science. It's science that is kept from the common people. You know, like if you see something on TV, oh, we have this new G-Wiz microchip that... 
runs it, you know, like two teraflops and blah, blah, blah. Well, you can bet that they've had it for like 20 years. You can assume that anything that they're letting us have, they've already had for 20 years, and we're getting the sloppy seconds. So there's all kind, like just as an example of this, my wife Sharon used to work at the university years ago, in fact, 70s, University of Wisconsin Medical School in a top secret area. And they were cloning bodies and body parts back then at the University of Wisconsin. And that was like in 1975. That's 30 years ago. And now, oh, well, we're almost ready to clone a person. We don't really want to do that because it might be illegal or immoral. They've been doing it for years. They've honestly been doing it for years. And the kind of occult stuff that was being done involved actually reaching into DNA and twisting and transforming the DNA. And I think this is one possible scenario for the mark of the beast. Because these people have plagues in the wings, which makes Ebola look like, you know, a case of the measles. And um, what I think might very well happen is they're going to somewhere down the road introduce a just incredibly scary plague on the earth. Something where you're, you know, bleeding from every pore and, you know, horrible stuff happening. And then they say, oh, but guess what? We found the vaccine. But the only catch is you have to bow the knee and worship our great world leader who gave us this vaccine. And then you'll get your shot in the arm and you'll be safe from this horrible disease. And when they give you that shot in the arm, they will give you what scientists call the Luciferin gene. That's actually what they call it, the Luciferin gene. It's a gene in our genome that glows green under an electron microscope. And some preachers believe who have studied this, not scientists, but preachers, and again, I'm not a scientist, I'm just a mere preacher, that, that this is what came into Adam when he fell. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to promulgate even more of this. That this is like the death watch beetle that's inside of every human being, this Luciferin gene. And once you get this in your system, you're lost. You'll never, I mean, if you're, you know, and, and, you know, if you are a Christian, I don't know what it would do to you. But if you're not a Christian, forget it. Because you realize the human body, the human genome, has tons of what they call junk DNA. Now, what does that mean? It's DNA that either seems to not have any purpose or else we haven't figured out what it is yet. A significant part of the human genome is this junk DNA. And what the plan is, is to have these Luciferin genes take over all that junk DNA. So instead of there just being one, there might be hundreds. And what's going to happen then? You see, I personally, this is my only belief, and I can't support this except just it makes sense, that before Adam fell, there was no junk DNA. Everything he had was working on all cylinders. Because, you know, Yahweh don't make junk. You know? But when he fell, then a lot, of this, a lot of his abilities went away. His mind became darkened and clouded by sin. You know, the death entered the world. And what do you think the impact of this is going to be if all this fallen DNA is mingled in in massive quantities with people? So, you know, when you consider the nasty stuff that is already in vaccines, you know, and I, if you've heard my medical conspiracy video, you know I kind of get on the tub and thump against vaccines, but I believe they're extremely dangerous and that they're being used to introduce all sorts of nasty stuff into the general population. But this, to me, is a very possible thing because it's more subtle. I mean, everybody in their brother nowadays knows about Mark of the Beast. Yeah, you get this tattoo on your arm, you get this tattoo on your forehead. Everybody who saw it, remember those movies that came out in the 60s? You know, if you were, I mean, I saw them after I was saved years later. But, you know, I forget what they were called, The Thief in the Night. And there was like three or four, and they're kind of cheesy looking today because they look kind of dated and everything. But, you know, they were a good effort at the time. And, you know, but everybody knows about that. A lot of people aren't going to fall for that or else they won't care. This is scary enough and subtle enough they might very well care. 
magical seduction. By now, hundreds or perhaps thousands of women have been impregnated by the B'nai Elohim. And I've met a few of their offspring over the years. We've ministered to a few of them. And guess what? They can be saved just like everybody else. They can be set free just like everybody else. Just because they had bad parentage. That doesn't matter. Because as long as they have human DNA, as long as they have human free will, they can still come to the cross just like everybody else met this one young lady. She had already been set free, but she was the product of a fallen angel union with a high-level um, uh, witch, Satanist. And the only way you could tell her was anything a little bit different about her. She was very pallid, very pale, very black hair, which isn't that uncommon. But if she took off her dark glasses, have you ever looked into the eyes of a goat? They have kidney bean shaped pupils. And that's what her, pup her, her eyes were golden. And she had no eyelashes and her, her pupils were kidney shaped, not round like normal human beings. So she, had, she was saving up her money at the time to get special contact <laughs> lenses. But until then, she just had to wear dark glasses whenever she went out in public. But she loved Yeshua with all of her heart. And she was so grateful that he had set her free from all of that. And we've had several young people like that. Most of them, you know, in their, in their late, you know, late teens, early 20s. So don't lose heart. Even though some of this stuff seems pretty over the top and pretty scary stuff, hell hath no hurt that heaven cannot heal. Just remember that. Realize that our understanding of technology is very limited compared to the B'nai Elohim. These are beings of incredibly cold intellect, incredibly corrupt intellect, and they are utterly without mercy. Behind the scenes, both in science and technology, they and their human stooges have been hard at work introducing incredible technologies, things that are decades ahead of what we are allowed to hear about in the news. As part of our own magical training, we were taught how to turn on some of the genes in our body that were part of junk DNA. Now, I know I had no idea, that was, you know, 20, 30 years ago, how that has impacted us. I've renounced all of that stuff. I've repented of all of it, but you never know. In my particular case, for example, oddly enough, my blood type changed. My RH factor, I used to be, I can never remember which is which, O negative, and now I'm O positive. It's one or the other. And that's supposed to be impossible. But yet, you know, I gave blood once when I was in college, and I had one blood type, and I gave blood when I was in seminary after doing all of this weird stuff, and I had a totally different blood type. You know? So I, I think, yes, I've probably been tinkered with a little bit over the years. But I can't prove it. I don't have any memories of anything other than what I've already shared. Um, there's been dark hints of this stuff in the past. Occultists and authors like Aleister Crowley and H.P. Lovecraft wrote of these mysteries more than 80 years ago. Crowley talked about this being that came to him. Uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. Let me talk about Lovecraft first. Lovecraft was a novelist who was a very strange individual. He lived, he never married. He lived with these two maiden aunts as kind of a recluse in Providence, Rhode Island. And he wrote these very weird stories. All of them are very disturbing. They're not like your typical horror novels as they were written like 80 years ago when we were in a much more genteel society. But yet they give you the willies. And he talked about things like intermarriage between monsters and human beings about if you've ever read The Shadow Over Minsmouth, which I don't recommend, it's about this small seaport town of Innsmouth, fictional, in Massachusetts, where there's a Masonic lodge where they worship Dagon, the god of the sea. And these strange, shambling, frog-like creatures come out of the sea and mate with human women and they produce offspring. And there's, there's other stories that he wrote of similar vein. 
And what's interesting is everybody thinks, oh, well, this is all fiction. Well, one of the things Lovecraft supposedly created was the great elder god, or the great old one, Cthulhu. Remember Cthulhu? He's the being we called out of Lake Michigan just 20 years ago, 25, 30 years ago. My time flies when you're having fun, doesn't it? Hallelujah. Anyway, uh, God, I can't believe it's been 30 years since we did that. Anyhow, so is this stuff real or not? Let me share something. Uh, I read a thesis that was written by a scholar out in the East Coast who made a study of Lovecraft's background. His ancestry discovered that Lovecraft's grandfather was an Egyptian Freemason. That's the same kind of high-level Freemasonry that I was in, the 90th degree Masonry thing. And, uh, yeah, believe it or not, I was a 90th degree Mason. That's, that's another videotape. Anyway, and they think that maybe he had a trunk of these horrible forbidden books that Lovecraft talks about. And when he died, Lovecraft inherited those things. Because Lovecraft spent his life in terror. He would never go near the sea. He would never go underground. Because he writes about these beings like Dagon and Cthulhu that are living under the sea. And then he writes about these, these beings that live under the earth that crawl like giant worms and consume people and digest them very slowly, like Shub Negrath. Just creepy, creepy stuff. And, uh, and then there's always the crawling chaos in Yarlathotep. And then this is this is stuff that's 80 or 90 years old, and this guy is more powerful and more more popular now than he ever was in his lifetime. And he was writing about all this stuff, and now it's happening. I mean, strange things are coming out of the sea and breeding with human beings, because some of these UFO beings, some of these UFOs, come from under the sea. Don't forget what it talks about in the Book of Job. It talks about dead souls under the sea. And it's not talking about just dead people. Because, you know, a soul by definition can't be dead. Because the soul is the nefesh, the life principle. Then, we have good old Mr. Crowley. Oh, wait, forgot about that. we got to talk about Crowley. Uh, I forgot what the slide was. Crowley opened doorways into other dimensions. He had this being called Lam, who appeared who just looks exactly like the gray aliens. And, and he continually was trying to bring back these old gods by tearing open these dimensional doorways. And it went into another generation. Disciples of Crowley helped usher in major developments in this. Any of you may have heard of Jack Parsons. He's one of the fathers of American rocketry. He was also a disciple of Aleister Crowley and the founder of JPL Laboratory. Werner von Braun said that the American space program could not have existed without Jack Parsons. The other one in this little team was L. Ron Hubbard, who was a disciple of Aleister Crowley. And Hubbard, of course, went on to come up with Dianetics and found the <coughs> religion of Scientology. The less said about that, the better. Anyhow, these guys got together and did what was called the Babylon working. And they tried, they used a, a red-headed woman as a medium, and they tried to rip open the dimensional doorway all the way. And they apparently succeeded in doing it because something awful came through. And within a couple of years, Jack Parsons blew himself up in a rocketry accident. His jet fuel, fuel exploded. And of course, L. Ron Hubbard got out of that whole thing and decided it was much more secure to start a fake religion and get rich off it. So, you know, and it's going on into this generation as well. Here we see a comparison between this Lam, this is the being Crowley called up in 1918, and a classical gray alien that started showing up in the 1960s. Look how similar they look. As I said before, these were workings that were intended to open up doorways into other dimensions and permit dark gods to come in and resume their reign on Earth. See, in this cosmology, these beings believe that, that the good gods, like you know the God of the Bible, they came and threw these people out and cast them into other dimensions where they're trapped. 
And so these nasty black magicians are trying to awaken them. And look what has happened in our world and in our society in the last generation, how much things have, have I hate to say it, but gone to hell in a handbasket. And I think a lot of it is because of the magical workings that these people have done and the evil things that they've let into our society. Now, to bring this to a conclusion, that one of the things that really touched me when I was a young person, I was kind of into science fiction books. Got them at the public library. And one of the books I read was a book by Arthur C. Clarke, who is now the only living giant of the early golden age of science fiction left. There was this, they, they kind of called him the Blessed Trinity, so to speak, of, of Isaac Asimov, Robert Allen Heinlein, and Arthur C. Clarke. The other two have passed away. And Clark is still alive, although he's quite old by now. Anyhow, he wrote this book in 1953, an incredibly provocative vision. And I need to share this with you because I think it will help you understand what's happening here at the end of days. <clears throat> in this book, and it's, the material in this book has been copied, you'll recognize some of the scenes that are also in Independence Day. Huge UFOs come to Earth. Giant UFOs are hovering over all the major cities. The Secretary General of the United Nations is contacted by these people who identify themselves as the overlords. And they say they are here to watch over us. And they will not let anybody see us until they've been here for 50 years. But the Secretary General is taken up every now and then to the ship to meet with them and they, he looks at him through a one-way mirror, and he can't see them, but they can see him. Um, and he meets with the overlord leader who's called Carolyn. What happens is 50 years after the revive, they, or their arrival, they appear in person. And guess what they look like? They happen to be gigantic and red-skinned with horns and cloven hooves and a tail. These are the overlords. And they explain their purpose, that they have watched us as we entered into our nuclear infancy, our development of an atomic bomb, of hydrogen bombs, of nuclear power and space travel, because this is the end of humanity's childhood. And they say that the children that are now being born on the earth will no longer be human. They will be superhuman. And that they're here to midwife this birth. And basically the story ends with children being born all over the world that are like prodigies. prodigies. They're geniuses. They have awesome psychic abilities. And before you know it, the human race basically is ended. And this is where the famous line that Clark is often quoted as saying. He said, the earth is the cradle of mankind, but mankind can't live in a cradle forever. And so basically the earth is destroyed in a burst of light and all these superhuman children fly off into the cosmos. And that's childhood's end. Now this incredibly evocative vision is, I believe, very prophetic. That, that the beings that are now being brought into the world through this genetic manipulation, through the black magic and black science I've been talking about, this, the Antichrist was born in 1966, according to Satanists. On June 6, 1966, 666, you know. And as he aged, as he matured, they started targeting, with beginning with my generation, the baby boom generation, look what they did. You know, drugs, alcohol, free sex, all of this bizarre stuff. They introduced the use of powerful hallucinogens that were originally developed by the CIA. Uh, people like Timothy Leary said that if you took enough LSD, your genes would mutate and you would become what he called homo noeticus, new man, and that you would become the next step in human evolution. Now, unfortunately, he was right. DNA does cause genetic, uh, pardon me, LSD does cause genetic mutation, but there's not really any such thing as a good mutation. They're almost always bad because people are born with birth defects. And, of course, Timothy Leary himself died of prostate cancer a couple of years ago. Now we have the new thing that's coming along, the supposed indigo children. 
don't know if any of you have heard of this. But this, they're called indigo children because in Hinduism, they have this system that's called chakras. These are energy centers that go up the body. And the highest level chakra, the color that it emanates is indigo, if you can see auras. <clears throat> and so these indigo children are children that are born prodigies. You may have seen some of them on television shows like 60 Minutes or Prime Time Live. Some of these children are 9 or 10 years old and are getting PhDs in advanced mathematics. Some of them are brilliant writers already. Some of them are brilliant musicians. And a lot of them have extraordinary psychic gifts. What's going on here? Is this childhood's end? Well, the New Age wants us to believe that they are the salvation of the world. But let me tell you something. In our ministry, we've run into a few of these indigo children that were born into Christian families. And remember, every good gift and every perfect gift comes from the Father of lights, James tells us. And even though these New Age people are deceiving themselves into thinking that this stuff is, is somehow theirs, that it's their mojo, it's their magic, whatever you want to call it. We dealt with some of these children in, in deliverance and what we found is they're incredibly gifted, incredibly spiritually sensitive children that just need to have themselves be set free by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then, can these kids move in the area of the gifts of the Spirit, in the area of prophecy, I mean, some of the, I, we met one such child over in London. The case was so severe, the parents actually flew us over to London to help the child. An extraordinary young lady, eight or nine years old. And that child is going to do something for the Lord, let me tell you. And I, I am hopeful about this because I think, again, what, whatever Satan tries to do, Yahweh's like the master chess player and he's ten moves ahead. And I would just counsel you to really, those of you who are, who are younger, who have young children, love them, pray for them, pay attention to them. Because I think children nowadays are being born with some very special stressors and some very special gifts. Because that's how it works down here, unfortunately. If you don't have challenges, you don't have gifts. And... I, all I can tell you is I really believe that the new generation that's now coming up, the, that are now 9, 10, 12, 15 years old, are going to be extraordinary. And, you know, I think we're going to need those children because I think things are going to get pretty tough around here with all this stuff going on. And we need them, and we need them desperately. So those of you who have children, who are young enough to have children, you know, take care of them. I mean, this is redundant to even say it. I hope you would. But if they, if they seem to be a little bit unusual, pray for them, minister to them, be patient with them. Because I think it's because they're going to blossom into a generation that the world has never seen. I think they're going to blossom into the generation that is going to see the second advent of the Messiah. Thank you and Yahweh bless you. All right, what is the, uh, the good news? What is the solution here? What are we really trying to do? We've heard a lot of strange things. We've heard a lot of evil things. We've heard a lot of the, the tricks and traps of the devil. But I'm here to tell you tonight the, the real good news in all of this is that Jesus came to set the captives free. Our God is the good God. Our God that has the heart of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. That is his personality. And he wants everyone to come and live in heaven through eternity with him. But if we do not accept Jesus, then he is obliged to cast us into hell along with the devil and his angels. But all we have to do is take a first step in that right direction. The thing of it is, is, to serve the devil gets really complicated and he almost always tells you that you can never get out. And yet with Jesus, it's simple and you can walk away, unfortunately, too easy. 
because the gospel is simple. That's what the Bible says. It's simple. All right, so how do we go to heaven? How do we become saved? How do we move from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light? How do we walk away from whatever it is we've done? Whatever sin. There's only three sins that cannot be forgiven. And that is taking the mark of the beast, blaspheming the Holy Spirit, or suicide or destroying the temple because obviously you already died. However, outside of that, every other sin can be forgiven. How do we do that? Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. In other words, we've all messed up. The Bible says that before we were born, we were sinners. It's like when Adam ate of the fruit, he got a virus. And that virus went into us, and the only thing that can kill that virus is the blood of Jesus. Then, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace you are saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, lest any man should boast. In other words, we cannot earn our way into kingdom, into kingdom of heaven. We cannot buy our way. I just was watching uh, the other day on American Airlines, now is offering a way for you to buy sky miles. Instead of flying those miles, you can buy those miles, but brothers and sisters, there's no way you can buy yourself into heaven. You can't do it. It's a free gift. That's what it says. So if it's a free gift, how do we reach out and take that free gift? It's simple. Romans 10, 9, and 10 gives the answer. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, then thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. What's that saying? It's simply saying it's not enough to believe Jesus was God in the flesh, died on the cross, and not say it. It's not enough to say it and not believe it. We've got to believe it. We've got to say it. It takes two things. The final thing is Acts 2.38 says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission or the washing away of your sins, the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. All right? What does that word repent mean? See, here's where a lot of Christians go wrong. They think, oh, well, I want to go to heaven... But see, they don't want to live a consecrated life. Oh, uh, I, I don't want to be sent to hell, but I don't want to live good either. See, I still want to live my life. And see, that's not the way it's got to be. So when it says repent, it means that here's, here's, where, here's repent, okay? I was walking through my life, living my life the way I wanted to live it, and then I realized I made a mess of my life. How many have been there? Okay? made a mess in my life. He's not working with me running my life. There's got to be a better way. There is a better way, and His name is Jesus. So then we ask Jesus to come into our heart. But we can't, brothers and sisters, keep walking the same way. Repent means we say, all right, I'm not going to live my life the way I want to anymore. I'm going to live my life according to the Bible. And here's repent. Watch, watch. We turn our life on some old words we used to say. Some old habits we used to do. We're going to lose some friends, by the way, brothers and sisters. That's right. See, we turn our life and we say, Jesus, I'm going to follow you and follow your teachings. The reason, brothers and sisters, they call them Buddhists is because they followed the teachings of Buddhists or Buddha. The reason they fought, call them Islam is they follow the teachings of the Quran or Allah and his so-called prophet of God. Yet in Christianity... Well, do you go to church? Mm, no. Oh, but I'm a Christian. And yet, there's no difference in the divorce rate between the church and the world. There's no difference in the abortion rate between the church and the world. There's no difference in the mouths of the Christians. Christians means we read the Bible, we follow the teachings of Jesus to the very best of our ability. That's what. So when I pray this prayer... Don't just pray the prayer just because you want to go to heaven. Pray the prayer saying, all right, I'm going to live following the teachings of Jesus. I'm going to pause for a second. I want to let that sink in. If we call ourselves Christians, brothers and sisters, we ought to do our best to live Christian. Now, here's the truth of the matter. There's all a little bit of hypocrite in all of us. The reason is because we have a goal we can't reach. That goal is to be Christ-like. We've got to try to reach that goal, try to be Christ-like, but no one can. It's only by the blood of Jesus. It's a free gift. 
And that's the reason a lot of the sinners say, well, I'd go to church, but there's not a bunch of hypocrites down there. Well, fine. I guess it's better to stay out there with the devils than try to at least come to the people that are trying to clean up. All right. If you want to go to heaven, I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer. Now, I know you Christians have been to a lot of these meetings. You've probably prayed this with me hundreds of times. I pray it every day. Lord, forgive my sins. Let's all say it together. Bow your head, close your eyes, and no one looking around. Dear Heavenly Father, I confess with my mouth, and I believe in my heart, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, died on the cross, arose three days later. I accept His blood to wash my sins away, to write my name in the book of life, to keep me holy, and to save me in the day of trouble. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, that's the first step. That's just the first step. Now, we've got to learn the Bible, King James, and we've got to follow the teachings of Jesus to be a Christian. If you do this, I will see you in heaven. God bless.